I'm Shauna Smith alongside Brad Smith. This is Yahoo Finance's flagship show, The Morning Brief, the ultimate guide to help investors make smarter decisions for their portfolio. We're tracking early session volume while bringing you today's top market themes and elevating Yahoo Finance's most popular newsletter. That's right. We've got a lot of ground to cover this Tuesday morning. Futures edging higher with stocks looking for a comeback after days of back-to-back -back losses. But Wall Street's bullish mood prevails as more strategists raise their year-end targets on the S&P 500. And it's a big week of econ data. We are going to get a fresh reading on consumer confidence. That's at a 10 a.m. Eastern time today. Later on this week, on Thursday, fourth quarter GDP growth. And on Friday, the week's most important economic data point for the market, that's PCE. The Fed's preferred inflation gauge, that is going to be released on Friday, 8.30 a.m. Eastern time. So let's get right, right to it. The three things that you need to know, your roadmap for the trading day. Yahoo Finance's Jared Blickery, Alexandra Canal, and Madison Mills have more. Thank you, Shauna. Futures edging higher after slipping from recent records on Monday. Now, Wall Street strategists remaining bullish on stocks as they continue to patiently wait for the Federal Reserve's first interest rate cut this year. In an exclusive interview with Yahoo Finance yesterday, Chicago Fed President Austin Goolsby had this to say about the timing of the interest rate cuts. As you know, the summary of economic projections is not forward guidance, is not debated Investors are eagerly awaiting the government's release of core personal consumption expenditures. That price index is due and will hint of future cuts. Plus, former President Donald Trump's newly merged company, which owns the social media app Truth Social, began trading on the NASDAQ today under the ticker symbol DJT, which also happens to be Trump's initials. The startup went public via a merger with Digital World Acquisition Corp, a special purpose vehicle that's been trading since 2021. Trump's ownership stake could fetch more than $3 billion now that the company is public. Shares are up more than 20% in pre-market trading. And Reddit shares extending the rally in pre-market trading after closing up 30% on Monday. Now, some analysts believe that bullish bets from options traders could be pushing that stock higher as we head into today's trade. And Reddit was among one of those top gainers on the New York Stock Exchange heading into this week. Let's get you started with a check on stock futures here. Stocks on pace for their fifth straight month of gains. At least when you take a look at the big board today, a bit of a different picture than what you were looking at yesterday. You've got the Dow futures, S&P, and NASDAQ all pointing to gains at the open. We're even looking at a move to the upside here, potentially for the Russell 2000. And looking at some of the sector action or what we're seeing beneath the surface of some of these uh, major averages here. When you take a look at the NASDAQ, still a bit of a mixed picture. You've got some of those names and moving to the downside here in pre-market trading. Actually, a number of them regaining some of yesterday's losses with Google, Microsoft, and at least Meta on track to open the day in the green. Apple, though, still moving to the downside. And taking a look inside the Dow, a couple of names that we're going to get into in just a little bit. But again, a bit of a mixed picture, much more green. You can see some little boxes here on your screen, recouping some of yesterday's losses there, Brad. Yeah, and you mentioned those sectors. We'll just briefly take a look at that extended hours move here. Pre-market, you've got a lot of green across the screen. Really, only one flat, just barely to the downside, and that is real estate. So we'll see if that can get right. But I want to focus in on crypto for a hot second here as we're taking a look at Bitcoin. Why? Well, back in that 71,000 ballpark here, just above it as of right now. It's up 6% over the past 24-hour period. That is the intraday period for crypto. And then I'll just toggle out of this here real quick and we can take a look at some of those crypto touching stocks or crypto holding stocks in some cases. MicroStrategy had a massive day yesterday. It was up 21% here, of course, of Michael Saylor fame. We're taking a look at an extended hours move right now of about 2.4%. Also an interesting move that you're seeing across the board. Robinhood, they've got a big announcement. That's coming forward later on tonight. And so we'll see exactly what the company has to say there and what Vlad Tenev puts forward and into this market year. But you're seeing that benefit yesterday plus today pre-market by about 1.7% as a crypto-touching company. A lot of green on the screen there yep. for crypto and those crypto-related companies. All right, well, let's take a look at the major averages because we have stocks looking to extend the market's record-setting rally that we saw at the end of last week. Investors remaining optimistic about rate cuts. More than 70% of traders are betting that the Fed is going to cut rates in June. Now, in a Yahoo Finance exclusive, Chicago Fed President Austin Goolsby weighed in on his expectations for cuts. I don't ever like tying our hands 
or signaling that we've made up our minds or that I've made up my mind before the meetings when we're going to get a lot of data between now and whenever that decision has to be made. We just got to make sure that, that we're on trend. We never, we, I believe that we should never rule out or rule in anything when we've got a whole lot of, of data to come. To break down what this means for the markets, we want to bring in Seema Shah, Principal Asset Management, Chief Global Strategist here with us. Seema, it's good to see you here. So just talk to us just how important rate cuts you think are to the market at this point and whether or not this movement to the upside can continue if we don't get the three rate cuts that the market's currently betting on. Hey, great to be on with you. So, Luke, I think the rate cuts at the moment, they are important. They are certainly important for market sentiment. And you can see that every time uh, the market maybe starts to move out that first rate cut, you know, the kind of the future start to flounder a little bit and you start to see investor sentiment wane. If you were to look forward, though, if, if you're not going to get rate cuts in June because it's a really strong economy, that should imply that earnings growth is still very strong. And that should be enough to firepower the equity market higher, maybe not to the level that you would get if it was combined with rate cuts, but it's still a fairly positive story. It's only if you don't get rate cuts because inflation is really starting to take off. Uh, that would certainly be a more negative scenario, but it's not our base case at this stage. What is the playbook, Seema, at this juncture for fewer rate cuts than expected coming into this year, plus higher for longer? Is it still possible to see even more all-time highs if that is what actually plays out? Oh, absolutely. Look, this is, you know, historically, uh, very few occasions, but historically when there has been a soft landing and you combine that with rate cuts, that has been the best foundations for the equity market and for broader risk assets as well. So if that does play through, even if it's just three rate cuts, that's a fairly good story to have. Um, that should mean that not only the broad equities, but actually parts of the equity space which were fairly unloved last year, where, where valuations are very attractive, so I'm thinking small caps, value parts around the world, um, they can do better, but some of them are very much dependent on the rate cut, although the broad uh, equity market is most based on um, on the earnings story. Zima, given what we heard from Austin Goolsby on air with us yesterday and given what we heard from Jay Powell last week, and second that all up, how does this affect or does it at all affect recession risk right now, given the fact that the economy once again has remained so resilient up until this point? So I think it was very interesting to hear from Austin on that because he's making some really important points, which is that this is not forward guidance. This is their best guess, assuming that the economy moves in, in the way that they're expecting it to. But undoubtedly, the next three months of data are really pivotal in terms of deciding whether or not the Fed will get the rate cuts that they're looking for. If on the off chance that you actually start to see inflation taking off again, which would then push out rate cuts maybe into 2025, you do start to have a slightly more negative scenario for the economy. Um, but as I said, that is not our base case, but it's something that we do need to watch out for fairly carefully right now. Is the Fed going to be leading the rest of the world or the rest of the world and other central banks? Are, are they going to be the first to cut even ahead of the Fed? And what does that mean more globally for some of the most internationally exposed or dependent companies, especially here in the U.S.? Yeah, it's a great question because historically, you know, most central banks have waited for the Fed to take the lead and then they followed suit. Um, but you have got a slightly different situation this time because whereas the US economy is really strong, if you look across to Europe, to the United Kingdom, their economies are either in recession or kind of near stagnation. So for them, rate cuts are certainly more urgent. They probably will have uh, come through around the same time around summer. But once they start to cut rates, they will probably move with a greater urgency. So as the Fed only three cuts for this year for the ECB, the Bank of England, and a couple of others. We are looking at more rate cuts. And then from an international market perspective, you know, the main implication is what does that do to the dollar? So we are looking at another year of a strong dollar. Um, so certainly for international markets, there will be some implications of this. But overall, uh, you know, with the soft landing and rate cut scenario that we have, this is still an environment where the U.S. market can probably be the, the outperformer for 2024. Asima, talk to us a little bit more about the leadership. You were mentioning uh, portfolio positioning there just a few minutes ago. But when we talk about the leadership that we've seen only from a handful of tech names, yes, it has started in the market breadth, has started to widen out just a bit. Are you at all worried about some of those frothy valuations that we are seeing within tech? And, and, and what does that mean? How big of a risk then does that potentially pose to the broader markets, if at all? 
So we're looking at the valuations, of course, they, they are high, but we are not too concerned about froth. We're not really comparing it to the tech bubble because we do think that the earnings um, expectations are, are quite fair and that they will deliver. And we're looking at big tech um, over a longer term period. You know, there certainly could be volatility in the near term, but really technology is there for, is, is a long haul trade rather than something that you're just looking at for six months. Now, having said that though, if you do get this combination of soft landing and, and, um, and rate cuts, that should mean that you see a broadening of the rally. That doesn't necessarily mean that the large cap tech names start to struggle. It just means that you could see some other parts of the market join in with their strong performance. If, you know, in that negative scenario where the large cap tech just doesn't deliver on it, on earnings and they do pull back the market, well, then yes, there's a lot of vulnerability for all the broad space. But again, it always depends. What is the reason? What is driving it? And if it's driven by strong growth, um, and rate cuts that should typically be a good environment for all risk assets. It's been interesting because it, to this point at least, has seemed like it's been driven largely by a lot of fanfare around generative AI and some of the core themes playing out for this overcrowded long tech trade here. W what does higher for longer then kind of imply for that long tech trade and, and where we've already seen this be piled into? Yeah, you know, it's interesting because, as you said, typically when we think of higher for longer, higher rates, they shouldn't really do well for the growth companies like technology. But you've seen in the last year or so that it hasn't really played out like like, like that. Hmm. Um, these companies, they have the big balance sheets and they have the pricing power, they have the cash. Um, so they're really able to withstand some of the economic um, obstacles that could come in play. Now, for the big tech space, you know, as we said, the valuations are quite expensive. What we're starting to hear from investors and from clients is that they're thinking about the next generation of companies that will benefit from, from generative AI. So we're looking at stuff like healthcare within agribusiness, uh, data centers. These all stand to benefit quite significantly from AI. Um, and that's where you could have additional gains coming to. So those are the other areas that we're focusing on. Seema Shah, Principal Asset Management, Chief Global Strategist. Thanks so much for taking the time here ahead of today's trading session. We appreciate it. Great, thank you. Former President Donald Trump's newly merged company, which owns the social media app Truth Social, made its debut on the NASDAQ today under the ticker symbol DJT. To break this down for us, we have Yahoo Finance reporters Alexandra Canal and Rick Newman. Ali, let's start with you. You're here on set with us, and yeah. you've got some of the details on this DSPAC, this merger. Yeah, and we're seeing this newly merged company trading to the upside this morning. Shares up about 30 percent right now in pre-market trading, just under $65 a share. We'll continue to track that to see where it opens. But this debut, part of a special purpose acquisition, otherwise known as a SPAC deal. We haven't heard about SPACs in quite some time, but here we have Trump Media and Technology, uh, Technology Group, which is a parent company of Truth Social, Social, merging with special purpose vehicle, Digital World Acquisition Corp, otherwise known as DWAC. Now, this was a deal that was approved by shareholders last week prior to the merger, DWAC had been trading on the public market since 2021. Of course, True Social, this was a social media app that was founded by Donald Trump after he was kicked off major platforms like Facebook and Twitter, which is now known as X, following the January 6th riots in 2021. Uh, Trump is going to maintain roughly a 60% stake in this company, which means he could stand to receive a significant payout down the line with his shares value at at least three billion, if not more, depending on trading levels. But uh, he won't be able to cash in quite yet, according to the stipulations of this merger. There's a six-month lockup period, unless there's a special exception that's approved by the board. So he's not going to be able to use the funds to, to help with his uh, lawsuits that he has ongoing, along with a, a campaign fundraising shortfall that he has uh, as he gears up to face President Joe Biden in a 2024 rematch. So this will be interesting interesting to see how this all plays out. I mean, certainly, uh, I think a net positive for, for Donald Trump moving forward that he potentially has access to this. Again, you're seeing shares trade at just under 65 bucks. Rick, what do you think? Is this a net positive for Trump? Because like Ali was just laying out there, yes, he owns about a 60% uh, stake here in Trump media, media, nearly a 60% stake. Yet the big question is when he is going to, if he's going to be able to sell shares in the timeline that he wants to sell his stake. This is a windfall for Trump, no matter how you look at it. Uh, uh, you know, at the opening price yesterday, his stake was valued at about 3.3 billion. 
and the shares are up. Uh, it's hard to ca calculate between the one ticker now flipping over to the other, but they seem to be up something like 25% since then. So his his stake might now be worth more than $4 billion, which uh, could more than double his, his total net worth. I mean, whatever restrictions might be on his ability to sell for the next six months, I mean, that that is a huge win for Trump. Um, now, what happens next is quite interesting. I, you know, from what I've been able to tell by looking at analysts and people who, who are understanding the company, this all, this can't really be anything other than a meme stock at this point. The, the company loses money. It doesn't have very much revenue. So w where is the value in this company? I mean, and you almost have to say this is a binary uh, investing decision. If Trump does get elected president, then Truth Social could end up be uh, the social media network where everybody has to be. It's going to be the place where the conversations are happening about the next Trump administration. If he loses, uh, Truth Social is just a rump social network that's way smaller than other competitors like X and Facebook and Instagram. And it's hard to see what the value is. So um, this is going to be a fascinating stock to watch for the next six months, seven months as we get into the election, because it all it seems to be almost directly a play on whether you think Trump's going to win the election or not. Yeah, Rick, uh, and to your point on the revenue and uh, typically how social media companies make money is on their advertising revenues that they're able to bring in. That's how they create this kind of, well, largely free, but in some cases increasingly freemium type of model. And this is a company that, according to some regulatory filings, only had about $3.3 million during the first nine months of 2023. And so how they get to a $9 billion valuation off of that is... <laughs> Wildly speculative at this point, it seems, yep. at best. Absolutely. All right, Ali and Rick, thanks so much for taking the time here today. Yep. We'll be tracking shares of DJT. Also, we're tracking shares of RDDT. Reddit shares continuing their climb in pre-market trading after closing up 30% on Monday. Analysts saying a flurry of bullish bets from options traders could be pushing the stock higher. Joining us now on this, over at the Wi-Fi Interactive, we've got our very own Jared Blickery. Hey, Jared. Hey, Brad, thank you. And yesterday was the first day of options trading. It now happens on day three, and today is day four. But let me just give you a brief review of what happened yesterday. 90,000 options contracts traded. That is a huge amount. The record, I believe, was set back uh, in 2012 by Facebook. And since this is another social media company, there's a lot of comparisons going on. But let's take a look at the price action. You can see it's trading at $66.99, $67. That is up another 12% from yesterday's close, which itself was up 30% from the close prior. And just a quick look at the price action. We only have uh, three days worth of price history here, but you can see after it opened up around 50 or so, it kind of languished uh, for a day or so. And then only yesterday was it able to break to the upside here. Uh, but some of the strikes in the options market that are attracting the most interest, that is the number, the uh, share, the share levels that are attracting the most interest are so some of those big round numbers. So $50 per share. That was basically where we closed on the first day of trading. You go down below $25 per share. You go above the price, $75 a share. So nothing too big there. But you know, with the name Reddit itself, given its position within the GameStop lore and all that saga, you got to wonder, is Reddit going to become a meme stock itself? Could be. Too early to tell, but could be. So interesting to keep this an eye on this ticker today. And we certainly will, because the move to the upside, I think, surprising even those who were excited and 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 believed in this story. But this dramatic move to the upside makes a lot of sense when you take a look at some of the option action. All right, Jared Blickery, thanks so much. We'll keep right here on Yahoo Finance. Much more ahead, Adam Newman reportedly looking to regain control of WeWork. We've got the details for you next.
Co-founder and former CEO of WeWork, Adam Newman, reportedly making a $500 million bid to buy the company, according to the Wall Street Journal. WeWork previously reached a valuation of $47 billion at its peak before filing for Chapter 11 bankruptcy back in November here. They're taking a look at the shares that trade over the counter right now, uh, and they yesterday moved higher and ultimately coming into the start of trade. We'll see exactly where it opens up at, but moved higher by about 216% on this news. Yeah, you know, this report was interesting to me. One, the fact that he's offering 500 million, trying to b buy back WeWork, not exactly a huge surprise given the fact that he has shown clearly continued interest in the company ever since he was ousted as CEO several years ago. But what struck me as interesting was in the letter that he sent to WeWork advisors saying that he was joining, now this is all according to a report from the Wall Street Journal, he was joining with Dan and Loeb's Third Point Hedge Fund and other investors in exploring a bid for the company, yet Third Point commented back saying that they're not a part of the offer. So there's a lot of questions surrounding this offer, who exactly is involved, how exactly he's going to get to that $500 million in funding. But we work the path forward, obviously, very murky, unclear. The company filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy back in November, so several months ago. They say that they remain focused on restructuring their business, trying to emerge from bankruptcy in the second quarter of this year. They're saying that they are still confident that they could emerge as a stronger, uh, financially profitable here company at some point. Adam Newman, though, going back and being at the helm of WeWork, I don't know if that's exactly progress or what people would essentially want to see at this point. I don't know that we, yeah, I don't know that after documentaries that have emerged about how he was managing the company, how many kind of coverage, uh, and, and ultimately how we've looked at this entire story unfold just seems like another instance of a massive fail up uh, in the $350 million he was able to get in funding as well from Andreessen Horowitz later on for Flow, which was going to disrupt the real estate industry. W wasn't WeWork supposed to do that? Yeah. I mean, my well, goodness. And that's the thing. And also, uh, despite all this and the troubles that they've had uh, previous to what played out during the pandemic and during the pandemic, obviously we have seen a certain massive workaround or rework of how people are working in an office right now. The need for WeWork space is exactly yeah. what that does to the potential here for commercial office real estate exposure in the future. We work obviously very much at the center of that. They have been trying to adjust their business. Their uh, executive team has come out time and time again saying that they are trying to restructure their business and position their bu business a better here for the future. So beyond Newman even potentially coming back, there's lots, lots of questions about what demand is going to be like for WeWork's yeah. business on a fundamental level there uh, before anything really gets off the ground. Absolutely. All right, well, we'll keep right here on Yahoo Finance. We are just minutes away from the opening bell on Wall Street. We will take a look at some of the biggest movers here of the day. Again, taking a look at futures, all three major averages set to open in the green. We'll be right back. It's a jam-packed hour, focusing on the biggest movers and shakers on Wall Street. This is market domination, and here, every day is game day. We have one hour left until the market close. It's game time for investors to make their final plays. The clock is ticking, and we've got you covered with our quarter-by-quarter -quarter playbook. We're bringing you in on all the market action. With step-by-step -step analysis of our biggest trending tickers and expert insight into the day's biggest headlines. We'll bring you the closing bell and get you to the finish line. This is Market, Market Domination. Domination. Tune in daily from 3 to 4 p.m. Eastern.
Hey, big opening bell energy coming your way in just a few seconds here. We're here to get it started off for you on this Tuesday trading session. Take a look at the Dow, the S&P 500, and the NASDAQ futures. We are higher across the board as we inch closer to the opening bell. You're taking a look at fractional gains for the Dow, the S&P 500, and the NASDAQ. And right here, right now, here and now, as Luther Vandross would say, is a look at the opening bell at the NYSC and the NASDAQ, where you've got... United Football League ringing the opening bell there. Kurt Menefee as well there, a longtime voice in football. And so we'll see exactly uh, how this one performs. We got a fist bump right? down on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. ATS really coming up with the excitement. We were, we were wondering whether or not they were going to live up to the excitement that's playing out the NASDAQ right now with Fox, but certainly kicking off another day of gains, at least what it looks like here at the Open as we take a look at the big board and some of the excitement. What? How could they top the Funfetti? I know, it's hard. You can't top but Confetti. That's, that's really that's difficult to do. Fault. Yeah, we need to bring the Funfetti to the, floor of this, to the exchange. Yeah. All right, let's take a look at some of these major averages because we are seeing some green on the screen, a bit of a reversal from yesterday's losses, trying to claw back and get to those record-setting highs, which we are set to at least be attainable at this point if we keep this momentum to the upside. You've got the Dow up just about a tenth of a percent. The Nasdaq also moving to the upside here up nearly a half of a percent. The S&P also moving further above that 5,200 level. Many of the strategists that we have talked to over the last several days now obviously focusing in on 5,300 as they do get a bit more bullish here on the street. Russell 2000 also moving to the upside. Some movement in the small cap space. Then let's take a look yeah. at the heat map here, Brad. You were taking a look at some of the crypto stocks earlier today. Taking a look inside the Nasdaq, you've got a number of those larger cap tech names also pointing to gains here at the open. NVIDIA up nearly 1% here. And taking a look at that sector action green across the screen with the exception of industrials and real estate right now those two sectors under a bit of pressure but consumer discretionary financials also technology there among the outperformers in today's action. Yeah, consumer discretionary leading the pack, as you mentioned right now, higher by about a half a percent. Interesting here today, too. We've got consumer confidence data that's going to be coming forward, so that's going to be something mm -hmm. to pay close attention to. It's Nike Air Max Day as well, so we'll see if some of those discretionary dollars are going towards some uh, new feet heat out there, but ultimately... Some of yours? Uh, you know, i got to see what colorways are out there. Mm -hmm. I'm all about the colorways. they got to match. Yeah. Got to match and coordinate everything. Big so, sneaker you know. guy. Yeah. All right, let's take a look at crypto, because Bitcoin on the rebound, topping 70,000 after sliding under 60,000 last week. And this comes after U.S. spot ETF saw outflows of nearly 900 million. Here to break it all down, the Bitcoin moves that we're seeing our very own Yahoo Finance's Jared Blickery is here in the newsroom with a look. Jared. Yes, thank you, Shauna. Let's go to the Wi-Fi Interactive. Chart is worth a thousand words, and I think a collective sigh of relief is being <clears throat> is being uh, let out here because let me show you the three-year chart. We came up, we exceeded the prior highs by just a little bit, and as Bitcoin is known to do, it reversed on a dime. So let me show you the one-month price action, and you can see here we did. We sold off pretty hard from here into the uh, low 60s, but we have now rebounded, and all this looks like is a little bit of consolidation. I'm going to put a longer term chart in one more time. Here's a five year. Uh, you can see after coming up here, it would be perfectly normal to pause a little bit before moving on. And we have to be also open to the possibility that we head south again. But I think I think as long as 60,000 holds, uh, that's going to keep the bulls pretty comfortable in their positions here, not the least of which is to say the hold alerts. So here's Ethereum hasn't quite exceeded its highs, got up to about 4,000 a couple days ago, uh, still trying to exceed that. So very similar chart situation there. But I want to move on to gold as well, because that's something we've been tracking. Uh, GC equals F. That is the ticker we're looking for. Having a little bit of a technical difficulty here. There we go. And let's see if we can find gold was trading above $2,100 per contract unit. Here we go. It's up half a percent. So here's the overnight price action. Here is the year to date. Uh, anything above these levels here has been a record high. So it's been another run for gold. And as you can see, it's simply been consolidating by recent highs. So it makes you wonder where that next leg up, if it materializes at what price level it will be able to realize. All right, critical levels that we will keep an eye out for. Jared, thanks so much. Let's take a look at some of the trending tickers here at Yahoo Finance. First up, UPS shares this morning uh, moving to the upside up just about two tenths of a percent, setting fresh financial goals here for 2026. They now expect 108 billion to 104 
$15 billion in adjusted revenue and also saying that they expect adjusted operating margins of more than 13%, so a bit of an improvement here for UPS. We know the company, along with many of its competitors, struggling with a slowdown in package volume. That has been the case almost across the board when you compare it to the levels that we saw, obviously, when we were in the midst of the pandemic, when everyone, nearly everybody, was shopping from home. The e-commerce plays were very strong. So UPS has pivoted their business a little bit under their CEO. She's had this focus on better, not bigger, more focus on the profitable, or what she says is more profitable parts of their business. And at least at this point, taking into consideration, Brad, the guidance, mm -hmm. it looks like that turnaround plan or that plan here for recovery is starting to pay off. Yeah, a few of the segments that I just want to briefly take a look at here, because that is where they're kind of pointing towards, and you mentioned the operational efficiencies, that's going to place a lot of investor attention towards the margins that they've set forth mm -hmm. in these goals here. U.S. domestic package segment, adjusted operating margin, the target there, at least 12 percent. The international package segment, that adjusted operating raising margin that goal is between 18 to 19 percent and then supply chain solutions that operating margin they're targeting around 12 percent so all this considered it's going to really need to come in with free cash flow of somewhere between 17 to 18 billion dollars we'll see if they're able to deliver upon that that call though or that webcast began at 9 15 a.m this morning eastern time uh, so we'll see what more continues to come from a ups yeah exactly and it's also important to point out they're up against different competition they also reached that recent deal uh, here with the labor union. So that has added yeah. to some of their costs here. They've also been forced to be a bit more competitive on pricing as they do uh, now compete with USPS, obviously along with FedEx and some of those other uh, larger players out there. So again, UPS seeing a bit of an improvement and expect further improvement. We take a look at some of those key uh, critical levels. There. Yeah, and looking more towards the premium market here is what yeah. they added on to that statement out there too. Let's also take another look at a trending ticker that we're watching here. McCormick shares. Let's get spicy with it. Uh, they're on the rise after reporting first quarter net income jumped 19% from a year ago. The company's CEO saying they continue to expect improved volume performance throughout the year. It's because of me. It's because of me. I'm putting seasons really? on everything. Yeah. Well, not everything, you know, just in a uh, healthy proportion out there. All right. I know you're so good at cooking. I need to probably uh, buy trying. a bit more McCormick seasoning. Maybe that would help my cooking a little bit. But when you take a look at these numbers, it's clear that this company is positioned relatively well when you compare it to some of the levels that they were seeing just about a year ago. Improvement here, the stock up almost 6% in early trading. Their CEO, Brendan Foley, saying in a statement that the results for the quarter, coupled with their growth plans, gives them the confidence in achieving the mid to high end of their projected constant currency sales growth for 2024. So they're expecting continued growth here, looking out for the remainder of the year. Their net sales are just around $1.6 billion. That's an improvement from a year ago. Flavor Solutions net sales. Hey. Hey, this is what you're dabbling in a little bit here. That was up 4% from a year ago. So we talked about more and more people have been cooking from home, have been uh, not so much going to the restaurants during the pandemic. That fizzled out just a bit, but those who remain com committed to it, like you, really helping the sales here of yeah. McCormick. Flavor Solutions is going to be the name of my next album that I put out there into the world. Okay. Oh. Yeah, 17 tracks of nothing but tasty, delicious beats. Everyone, coming up, <laughs> shares of Krispy Kreme soaring on the Speaking sweet partnership. Yeah, right. <laughs> I've been dying to talk about this story all day. McDonald's, Krispy Kreme, what more could you want, folks? We got the details after the break.
Amazon Pharmacy is expanding its same-day delivery services to New York City and the greater Los Angeles area. Customers can get access to medication to manage flu, high blood pressure, diabetes, and other common conditions within hours, according to Amazon. Joining us at the desk with more, we've got Yahoo Finance's Anjali Kimlani. Hey, Anjali. Hey, Brad. That's right. Uh, Amazon launching this new service. So in addition to the regular delivery service that it has for pharmacy, now this is reducing the amount of time that it will take take four members and four patients to get access, and that's in the New York and greater LA areas. Now, this is in addition to where they soft launched in Austin, Indianapolis, Miami, Phoenix, Seattle, and College Station, Texas, the last one of note getting their deliveries by drone. So that's a little bit interesting. They're also pushing the idea of renewable energy and being eco-friendly. So a lot of these deliveries are going to happen by e-bikes, by Rivians. And it's also important to note that this is all coming out of nearby brick and mortar location. So they have these automated small pharmacy locations that they're operating out of. And that's where these prescriptions are coming from. And that's why the reduced time for receiving. This goes across the board for their 12,000 medications uh, that are available. And it's really, you know, how Amazon is sort of inching in on the broader pharmacy space. Independent pharmacies are really the only option right now for same day delivery or for uh, near term delivery other than mail order is the other option for a uh, patient. So this is really, you know, changing the game a little bit, if you will, and could be a game changer if they can expand to other really high need areas. So that's what we have to watch. It could be a massive game changer here, right? Um, thanks so much. Well, McDonald's and Krispy Kreme out with a sweet announcement this morning. The fast food joints are expanding their partnership. Joining us now at the desk, the details that we have all need to know, Brooke De Palma. Brooke, what do you have? Good morning. By the end of 2026, Krispy Kreme is expected to provide fresh donuts to all U.S. McDonald's locations. Now that is roughly 13,500 locations. And customers can order them individually or in a box of six. Now, this has been years in the making. This partnership originally kicked off back in late October 2022 with nine locations in Louisville, Kentucky, and surrounding areas. Then in April of 2023, they expanded to 160 locations in Louisville and Lexington, Kentucky. And this is what many analysts are calling an unlock for Krispy Kreme. This will deliver new revenue and profit streams, but it is a far way away. Once again, this partnership will be by the end of 2026. A nationwide rollout will happen then. And the uh, Krispy Kreme really needs to bulk up their delivery routes, their distribution routes. Right now, they can provide donuts to roughly 6,000 restaurants. That's more than 7,000 away from that 13,500. And ultimately, for McDonald's here, the breakfast competition is really heating up, and this is an exclusive agreement with Krispy Kreme through December 31st, 2026. And as others like Taco Bell, Burger King, Wendy's look to get into this breakfast uh, competition here, the margins are exceptionally good, analysts have told me in the past. And so it'll be really interesting to see how this all plays out. And once again, this is an exclusive partnership between McDonald's and Krispy Kreme through 2026, and certainly a yummy one as well. This is major for the Delivered Fresh major. Daily part of the business. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And what this means is <laughs> there's, they're giving it. Sean is not sold. It's but huge. this is a big deal. This is uh, major. But, but it really what it is. really means is that this is giving Krispy Kreme an opportunity to expand their points of distribution. Yeah. And then it will be more convenience or more grocery stores. And former CEO Mike Tattersfield has told us many times that they want to reach 50,000 points of access for Krispy Kreme. This is giving them an opportunity and a reason to do that expansion. I just want to no, are they going to taste as good as mm. they do? They're, they're delivered the fresh. They're delivered fresh. Can, yes. Can they come they in three different warm? options. Well, you can reheat it. McDonald's could easily add an option to reheat the donut. Eight seconds is all it needs. <laughs> it says it on the box. And okay. it's while well supplies yeah. last. So uh, I think you know, we just got to go try it out for ourselves. Got to go try it out. We like, some of our own research. It's like three main that. ones that they're going to be doing. It's the original yeah. glazed. It's the chocolate ice with sprinkles, and then you got the chocolate iced cream filled donut mm. as well. Yes. That's my kryptonite. All right. Appreciate it. Coming up, Boeing's <laughs> problems, they're escalating here, but the street still says it's a buy. We'll speak with an analyst from City on the other side of the break. It's a jam-packed hour focusing on the biggest movers and shakers on Wall Street. This is market domination, and here, every day is game day. We have one hour left until the market close. It's game time for investors to make their final plays. The clock is ticking, and we've got you covered with our quarter-by-quarter -quarter playbook. 
We're bringing you in on all the market action. With step-by-step -step analysis of our biggest trending tickers. And expert insight into the day's biggest headlines. We'll bring you the closing bell and get you to the finish line. This is Market, market Domination. Domination. Tune in daily from 3 to 4 p.m. Eastern. Boeing facing another leadership shakeup and the second CEO change since its 737 MAX 8 crash in 2018. Dave Calhoun announcing he will step down from the helm at the end of 2024. Our next guest remains bullish on the aerospace company, though, saying the move was both predictable and thoughtful. Jason Gursky, who is the city managing director and aerospace and defense lead analyst, joins us now. Great to have you here with us. Just take us into your thesis now that this management change is taking place and the second that has come because of the MAX line. Yeah, sure. Look, at the, I think we step back here and look at the big picture, right? Um, we've got an industry that has very, very large backlogs. Um, stretching out to the 2030s, well into the 2030s. In some cases, for some of these product lines, you have a duopoly. So it's not <clears throat> as if, uh, you know, Boeing's uh, customers have a lot of, um, of options here. So you've got huge backlogs, a lot of demand from customers, uh, and, but you've got a company that's struggling post-pandemic to produce aircraft uh, in the way that uh, it should kind of by design. So um they've got some some things that they've got to fix and part of that process i think is going to be bringing in some new management to help them get that done so 
Um, I don't think structurally the story's changed here, the long-term story, uh, which is why we remain relatively constructive uh, on the company and its and its stock. Um, we've just got to get through uh, the near term, which uh, in these kinds of situations with all turnarounds, it's always a bit messy. Yeah, Jason, talk to us a little bit more about not specifically who obviously you think the new successor is going to be, the new CEO is going to be, but more so mm -hmm. in terms of who they would be looking for. Do you think they're likely to go outside the company, maybe even potentially go outside the industry? Walk us through what you think is the most likely scenario here. Yeah, I think they're going to look at both internal and external candidates, right? Mm -hmm. They had recently elevated Stephanie Pope to the position of chief operating officer. Um, she has, uh, you know, a pretty accomplished uh, background there uh, within uh, Boeing, having uh, led the services business, um, CFO of the other two divisions uh, of the uh, of the company. Um, even spent some time in investor relations, talking to people like myself all of the time. So, she's, uh, I think she's, you know, beloved within the company. So, I think if they're going to go internal, she would obviously be the leading candidate. I think. To your point, it's a question perhaps of external uh, versus internal. And, um, you know, I don't know how, how this will play out. I think uh, most investors would certainly um, desire to have somebody with a strong engineering background, uh, somebody that uh, has a, a proven uh, ability to lead a manufacturing organization, um, I think would be pretty helpful uh, at this point. And there are certainly, um, you know, lots of current and ex-executives uh, across the industry um, that have that background. Jason, overall, would you say it's a good thing here for shareholders, new leadership? Um, well, to be honest with you, I think the way that they're doing this is, is the right way to do it, right? Um, you know, suggesting that they're going to uh, have the existing leadership step out at the end of the year, so give themselves uh, plenty of time uh, to conduct a really methodical search, uh, give the current uh, CEO plenty of time to de-risk what's going on at the company. Um, you know, they've got to get through this FAA uh, process and uh, get permission to increase their production rates uh, over time. Uh, so, look, I think they were, they're doing this the right way, right? Uh, give themselves uh, seven, eight, nine months uh, to go find somebody new and, and allow the current guy to, to continue uh, the work at hand. I think what would have been worse is just to have him leave and then, you know, put somebody in and then an interim basis or uh, not have a really smooth transition. And I think the way that they're doing this is spot on. Jason, one of the things that we were discussing at the desk yesterday was if this is an external hire that they bring in and they give that person carte blanche to really figure out what needs to be changed at the company. What do investors need to be paying closest attention to as there might be a major type of restructuring or repositioning even of the internal culture that has broader ramifications to the stock price? Yeah, you know, look, I, you know, this focus on safety is, it, it you know, job one uh, mm -hmm. at this point, right? And uh, making sure that they are uh, designing um, you know, I, culture's a really hard thing, right? It's it's a very intangible thing. So that uh, what I think they need to do is, is, is uh, if they're looking to change culture, is put in a series of uh, processes, uh, work processes in place that allow for them uh, to really emphasize uh, the, um, the behaviors that they would like to see from uh, the organization, right? Um, so there are all kinds of experts in uh, change management to design, you know, designing processes um, that will be at hand here, um, both internal and external, I would imagine, are going to be helping them out. But look, safety is the, the number one thing, right? And um, the uh, the pandemic has been really, really difficult on this industry, right? It's This is not an uh, isolated issue to Boeing and its suppliers. We're seeing this. Um, across uh, the industrial base, including on the defense side, the difficulty in um, in producing uh, quantities and the quality um, that uh, the industry kind of has has always expected uh, of these companies, and you know this great resignation that we had during the pandemic uh, resulted in a lot younger people coming into the workforce. Um, I'll go on just for one tiny little tangent here. The head of procurement at Airbus at the air show last year suggested that its American supply base used to fire and hire people, fire them during the downturn, hire them during the upturn. And in previous downturn or upturns, 
after a downturn, they'd reach back and hire back eight out of the 10 people that they'd fired or furloughed during the, uh, the, uh, during the recessionary environment. This time around, they've only been able to hire back two. So eight out of 10 in the past, two out of 10 this time. Uh, we've got a young workforce. And when you have a young workforce, you probably need to be uh, putting in some place some processes and having some inspectors to check quality. So Jason, with all of that in mind, of course, uh... Another question here at this is just in terms of the lost market share that we've seen from Boeing, uh, Airbus, uh, the rival there, benefiting from this. Does some of that shift that we've seen in power, does that have staying power? Or do you see Boeing have the ability here to eventually win back that lost market share? Yeah, the, the market share shifts are going to be pretty de minimis, um, I think, right? We have typically Boeing only customers. Airbus only customers, and then a kind of smallish, really relative to the overall industry, group of uh, airlines in the middle that fly mixed fleets. Um, so uh, you know the opportunity here for Boeing to lose shares, kind of with those with those airlines in the middle that are operating uh, mixed fleets. And um, you know I spoke earlier of the fact that they've got huge backlogs that stretch out into the 2030s. Airbus really doesn't have all that many available delivery slots uh, to offer up to uh, "quote unquote" unhappy uh, Boeing customers. So I don't I don't think we're going to see material um, share shifts here. I think you know if we did see you know a Boeing historically Boeing only customer you know decide to open up the aperture and begin taking deliveries of Airbus customers, that's when I think. Maybe you get a little bit more worried, um, but to date we haven't seen that. And again, Airbus really doesn't have any delivery slots to give any of these um, these airlines at this point. This is this is really a question of Boeing just got to put its head down, be transparent with customers, be transparent with the FAA, and get its work done. Mm -hmm. We will see whether or not that actually plays out. All right, Jason Gursky, always great to have you. Thanks so much for taking the time to join us here this yeah. morning. City's managing director and aerospace and defense lead analyst. Thanks. Great. Thanks. Now we're taking a look at former President Trump's newly merged social media company shares trading under the ticker symbol DJT, his initials jumping today, up just about 46%. Now Trump's true social app merging with SPAC Digital World Acquisition Corp last week. Of course, we're seeing a big move here in the first day of trading, up just about 46% under the ticker symbol, first day under this DJT. We'll keep right here on Yahoo Finance, much more after the break.
Welcome back to Yahoo Finance Live. I'm Shauna Smith alongside Madison Mills, my co-host for the 10 a.m. hour. We've got some breaking news to start off the show. Consumer Conference, the Conference Board's Consumer Confidence Index for March coming in just below the street's expectations, coming in at 104.7. The estimate was for 107, so a bit of a dip in terms of what the street was looking for. We know persistent inflation, obviously one of the headwinds, one of the challenges that consumers are grappling with at this point. We have seen sticky inflation really remain a consistent headwind for consumers over the last several months. One of the things that has been holding a consumer confidence back just a bit. So U.S. March consumer confidence coming in slightly below what the street had been looking for at 104.7. Maddie. Well, it's looking like we're still seeing some green on your screen when it comes to the S&P and the NASDAQ. The Dow just dipping below the red, but looking a little bit flat here. Uh, that could be due to these consumer confidence numbers coming in a little bit below the street's expectation, particularly because the street was actually expecting a beat here coming into this print. Uh, and that, again, follows some downside surprises that you mentioned, Shauna, as we look at the consumer confidence numbers. But having said that, I do want to take a quick look at the broader market market here. Interesting to even see that Apple is turning around into the green after being down in the red this morning following reports that iPhone sales out of China declined by 33 percent. That could be an indication to me that we're seeing some broader bullishness in today's trade in a more macro sense, given the idiosyncratic problems with that particular stock. And it's looking like the Mag 7 in general, other than Amazon, of course, doing pretty well in the pre-market trade. Of course, the Darlene Nvidia up five tenths of a percent there. I want to just see if I can grab a quick look at the broader market here. Yeah, we've got the NASDAQ up five tenths of a percent, the S&P close to three tenths of a percent. And we're still seeing the Russell 2000 up six tenths of a percent today. So seeing some of that broadening as well in terms of the gains, not seeing a lot of downward surprise following that consumer confidence print. Again, coming in below the street's expectations, these numbers come as markets were poised to hit a fifth consecutive month of gains and investors are still pricing in a 63% chance of a Fed cut coming up in June. And the economy, it just keeps roaring higher. As the market rally also continues, how should investors be thinking about their portfolios? Joining us now to weigh in is Amy Arnott, Morningstar portfolio strategist. Amy, thank you for being here. Talk me through your reaction to these numbers because the market seems to just be sloughing them off. Yeah, I, you know, I think it's a little blip. Um, you know, it might be slightly lower than people were expecting, but um, overall, the economy is st still doing really well. I think the big question mark is really inflation. And, you know, if we continue to see inflation moderating and Fed go ahead, go, goes ahead and uh, cuts interest rates l later this year, that would definitely be a positive for the market. Um, but, you know, overall, I think uh, our advice to investors is to try to stay focused on the long term and not get too distracted by the day to day uh, news headlines. So, Amy, you're focused on the long term, not getting distracted here by some of the day to day uh, volatility that we are seeing. But when you take into account some of that uncertainty out there and exactly what that could mean ultimately here for the market. If the, if the market doesn't get three rate cuts, you mentioned the fact that that is obviously optimistic here, what the market wants to see. What happens if we don't get three? Um, you know, I think if, if rates remain high, um, that would probably weigh down on the market a little bit. Um, but, you know, I think it all goes back to the reason for portfolio diversification, you never know which asset class is going to outperform in any given year. So that's why we always advocate having a diversified portfolio, you know, make sure you're not overexposed to technology stocks, which have obviously been huge drivers be behind the market's returns over the past year or so. Uh, we do think that the technology sector overall is now probably slightly overvalued. So, um, you know, we would, you know, advise investors not to make sure that they're not overweighted on technology stocks at this point and also consider diversifying into other areas like smaller cap stocks, which we think have much better valuations at this point. Amy, I want to build off what Shauna was saying, because if the Federal Reserve's moves are not going to be the reality check for this market, even if knowing that we don't know what the Fed is going to do, what could be the reality check to kind of pull back some of this momentum? You know, I think one of the reasons tech stocks have 
done so well is because the underlying earnings growth has been so strong. So it's a lot of people say there's a tech bubble, um, but I think the valuations are high, but so far the earnings growth and revenue growth has been there to support those valuations. Um, if something happened to you know any of the Meg Seven that they didn't generate um, the earnings that the market is expecting, you could definitely see valuations compress there. I mean, when it comes to some of that opportunity there, we certainly have seen more of a broadening, broadening out more participation from some of the underperforming areas of the market of last year. When we talk about that leadership, who do you see leading this next leg of gains? And is it going to be some of those names that have started to outperform when you take a look at financials, when you take a look at industrials, even materials on some points? Yeah, I think that's, you know, depending on uh, overall economic economic growth, you could definitely some, see some of those sectors well. But, you know, as I mentioned, we try not to focus too much on short-term market performance. Um, so we're really focused on looking for sectors and companies uh, that have strong underlying performance, strong competitive advantage, and are trading at a discount to our analyst estimates of their fair value. All right, Amy, great to talk to you here. Morningstar's portfolio strategist. Thanks. Thank you. Let's get to a top trending ticker here in Yahoo Finance, and that is Apple shares on the move after the Chinese government reporting that new iPhone shipments in the country fell about 33% last month, although Apple now just above the flat line. Now, this latest number here extending a demand slump that we have reportedly seen in the tech giant's most important overseas market. This is Apple's second consecutive month of lower shipments. They fell by about a third in the month of February. Foreign brand shipped only about 2.4 million smartphones overall there in China. Apple, the only major foreign player here in the Chinese market. We know that they have uh, had some trouble uh, really competing with some of the uh, Chinese players there within that space. Some backlash there, Maddie, as geopolitical tensions uh, have risen just a bit. So not necessarily a huge surprise that we are seeing this dip, given the fact that we had been, we've talked to a number of strategists, a number of analysts here on this show who have been forecasting this. I think the question, though, is how severe is it going to be in the long run and whether or not Apple is able to stem some of these losses. And whether Tim Cook has the potential to be able to turn it around. Yeah. We saw the video of him saying that he loves China and sees a lot of bright and shiny things in China's future. So we'll see if we have anything to hear from him as he's expected to be dining with Premier Xi Jinping this week. But having said that, it is an indication of the challenges that Apple has been facing all year, like you mm -hmm. mentioned, Shauna, with these declining sales out of China as consumers there start to buckle under a tough economy, but also start to move towards some of those more homegrown names. And we're seeing this play out in the EV space as well. Uh, that is leaving Apple stock down nearly 8% year to date, really trailing its peers in the Magnificent Seven. So a tough year for Apple stock. Very tough. Well, Fisker shares are under pressure today. The EV maker is warning of possible default after the New York Stock Exchange is saying it's beginning to process a delisting of that stock. To break this down for us, we have Yahoo Finance reporter Praz Subramanian. And Praz, what's going on with Fisker? Yeah, you know, it's it's not trading right now. It's, de it's been delisted. Uh, it's going to move over to OTC markets soon. But yeah, I mean, stock has been below a dollar for since January. Uh, so not delisting is not really a surprise, but I think what is what is uh, a warning that they gave is kind of surprising is that the delisting is triggering a requirement to repurchase some 2026 notes that become immediately due, and that'll cause them to default on 25 2025 notes that become immediately due. So it's like a, almost like a domino effect uh, for Fisker here trying to you know they need to raise liquidity, but then they're also going to be hit with these uh, redemptions. And you know I, this, this reminds me of, of the LA Auto Show 2021. I was there when they debuted the Fisker Ocean. And that was like the buzziest part of the show. There was It was packed, it was mobbed. We spoke to Hen Henrik there, he was all excited, the car looked great. And then to see where we are now from you know, almost almost three years from now, from then, it just seems, it's a, it's a, it's a sad tale of what's going on with Fisker. So what happens next? I don't know, I think that, that IP is pretty valuable, mm -hmm. so someone will, will get it at some point if they do file for bankruptcy. Maybe they can recapitalize, re, uh, I don't know, but I think what's yeah. gonna happen, it's gonna be sold to another company. And his last company was sold to a Chinese company and they mm -hmm. they kept the same design, called it something else like the Rivero or whatever, but it's the exact Fisker car from 10 years ago. So mm -hmm. maybe we'll see that happen again, but I don't know. 
for sure. Yeah, certainly. Well, we will see what happens to Fisker. I mean, we've talked time and time again over the last several months just about the demise, the fall of this company and all the uncertainty ahead at this point. Mm -hmm. And now, especially following what happened yesterday with the delisting. All right, pass. Yeah. Thanks. Well, coming up, we will get a sneak peek into the conversation of our very own Brian Sazi when he spoke with General Motors CEO Mary Barra on the EV industry as part of our Lead This Way series. We will dive into that next. The electric vehicle industry is looking for a charge. Shares of struggling EV startup Fisker, as we were talking about, now suspended as the New York Stock Exchange delisting that stock today, citing abnormally low price levels. This as the Henrik Fisker creation failed to secure a partnership with a large automaker. Woes for upstarts Fisker and rival Lucid come as EV demand in the U.S. continues to wane, putting pressure on prices and cash flows of young and old automakers alike. Still, General Motors Chair CEO Mary Barra says she remains committed to the electric vehicle push in a new interview with Yahoo Finance Executive Editor Brian Sazi as part of our Lead This Way series. 2024 is really a critical year because uh, this is a year of execution. We are always looking and optimizing what our product portfolio is going to be. But I would say, you know, we believe in an all electric future. Uh, completely. There's really two things that the customers are telling us they need to consider an EV. And one is uh, they need to know there's a robust charging network. And I mean, that's getting better quarter by quarter. So that's what we have to deliver to the consumers to drive EV adoption. 
getting the charging right and then getting affordability. And we're working on both. And that's why this year is so important because as we drive scale, I think we will be well positioned um, to have affordable EVs. General Motors CEO Mary Barra calling 2024 the year of execution for the company, saying that she believes in the all-electric future. But what does it mean industry-wide? Here to take a look at that, we want to bring in Tom Narayan. He's RBC Capital Markets, lead equity analyst of Global Autos. Tom, it's great to have you here in studio. If we just zoom out a bit and talk about the EV landscape right now, because this narrative has really formed over the last several months, talking about the fact that EV demand has kind of hit a wall. Yet in reality, sales are up dramatically, up 50% in 2023. What's your assessment of today's EV landscape? Yeah, I think uh, Mary pointed out just exactly what's happening. We're in this kind of lull period. Mm -hmm. um, you had a lot of demand that picked up the early adopters buying their $60,000, $70,000 Teslas. A lot of money from the pandemic that came in, right? Low interest rates. So I think it was just a pull forward of demand. And some of the things she pointed out are very true. Charging infrastructure is something that needs to be developed. I think a lot of that is psychological, though. You know, a lot of the early adopters charge their cars at home. Now we're reaching the mass market who are worried about how do I charge this thing? Mm -hmm. And so here's where I think there needs to be some development. And the second thing she pointed out is very true, pricing. Uh, these are really expensive. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, we're, we're not in this cash rich period that we used to be, interest rates are high. Mm -hmm. So these things need to adjust and we'll get there with EVs. It's definitely happening. It's just we're in this kind of lull period. It's unclear how long it lasts. It makes me think about BYD when you talk about the kind of split between lowering the cost of the vehicle and then needing to obviously worry about your income. That dynamic didn't really work out for them in their full year forecast coming out this morning. So which of those two matter more to EV players right now, the deliveries or the income? Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, if you're a pure play EV maker, right, like a Rivian or a Fisker or a Lucid, they don't have these huge balance sheets like a GM or a yeah. VW have. So for them, they need to sell these products. Mm -hmm. So a lull winds up being really, really problematic from a cash flow perspective. And that's kind of why the large caps, the legacy players like a GM, like a Volkswagen, like these guys are actually better positioned to weather the storm. Well, you talk about weathering the storm here, and you laid out the fact that pricing was too high. There's also some concerns just about the accessibility of chargers and how people are going to charge these vehicles when we talk about mass adoption. When you take a look at the next generation of EV vehicles that we are expecting, say, over the next 12 to 18 months, do they address any of those issues? Yes, that's a great point. Um, and what you had happening for years now is mm -hmm. the same EV type, mm -hmm. this small crossover or a sedan. Why? because the biggest drag on range is aerodynamics. So it's tough to make an SUV EV for a reason, right? Just big and boxy and heavy. Mm -hmm. And so you're finally gonna get those cars coming. That's where most of the demand in the US is, right? It's the SUVs, larger vehicles. So now you're gonna see those. Uh, GM is gonna put out their Blazer. There's a, there's a bunch of others that are coming online. That should help increase the demand for EVs Range is just a function also of just public charging. Mm -hmm. That just takes time to develop. It is being developed. We may be a six to a year, six months to a year out before it gets really robust. So again, I think we're just in this lull period and we need more models that cater to the demand what, what Americans want to drive. Mm -hmm. Well, that makes me think about this idea that I'm stealing from Dan Ives, that when people say they want an EV, they're saying they want a Tesla. Is that still true? I think that's definitely the narrative that's been going on for a while. I love Dan Ives, by the way. Um, <laughs> and I would say that, you know, that may change, right? Mm -hmm. As we get more models out there, I mean, the Model 3 and the Model Y at this point are a little bit stale, right? Mm -hmm. We're going to get their new car, by the way, um, in 2025, the second half. But between these periods, I do think it's an opportunity for some of these other companies to get their EVs on the road, GM, for example. And, and when, when that happens, I think that's a good thing for Tesla, right? Their biggest competitor isn't other EVs. It's the Toyota Camry. So if your neighbor has an EV, you're more likely to get one and you're more likely to buy a Tesla. So it's kind of like a you know, rising tide lifts all boats. Mm -hmm. I do think it's an opportunity for other EV makers to get their cars on the road. You talk about the opportunity for other EV makers. Tom, who do you think is best positioned 
at this point in the EV race. Not so much today and what we're seeing in terms of sales, but really what we will see in terms of leadership over the next, I don't know, say three to five years. Yeah, I mean, three to five years, it's That's still is too it three short, or is much? it five? Yeah. That's true, it could so, be a huge difference. Yeah, because I do think there is this huge push towards plug-in hybrids and hybrids. It's very mm -hmm. real, near term. Even GM is shifting towards, uh, they announced, I think, in February that they're going to be start pivoting to some selling some plug-in hybrids. A name that's really well positioned there is Stellantis, right? This Jeep and Ram. They're actually the biggest sellers of plug-in hybrids in the U.S. with a Jeep. They never really fully invested early on in the U.S. on full electrics. They always wanted a flexible architecture that lets them choose between, do I want more BEVs? Do I want plug-in hybrids? Do I want ICEs on the same platform? So I actually like them near term. Longer term though, it could be once the EV surge comes back, I actually think Tesla is pretty well positioned. So is the GM, right? Because both Tesla and GM benefit from the IRA. When they make their own batteries, the government gives them a huge chunk of change. I don't think that goes away even in a Trump victory. So that's something a lot of people aren't really looking at. It's a couple of years out. But longer term, when, the, when everyone does move towards full electrics, then I think a GM or a Tesla are better positioned. It's just near term. It could be these plug-in hybrid guys. You haven't mentioned Ford yet. <laughs> Where do they fall? Yeah, I, I think Ford, I think their professional business is great, right? Don't have to worry about electrification as much. The problem is they really went aggressively into full electrics early, mm -hmm. and now they're having a problem because the demand is slowing, but they already have this sunk cost. So they're seeing huge losses there. Until we see the bleeding stop there, I think people are a little bit cautious. Mm -hmm. Really great points. Thank you so much, Tom. Really appreciate you joining us. Tom you. Narayan, RBC Capital Markets, lead equity analyst of Global Autos. Stay tuned for the full interview with General Motors, Motors CEO Mary Barra as part of Yahoo Finance's Lead This Way series live on Thursday, March 28th at 10 a.m. Eastern. And coming up, Fluttershare slightly lower this morning after reporting its full year results. We're going to talk to the CEO, Peter Jackson, on the other side of this break. It's a jam-packed hour focusing on the biggest movers and shakers on Wall Street. This is market domination, and here, every day is game day. We have one hour left until the market close. It's game time for investors to make their final plays. The clock is ticking, and we've got you covered with our quarter-by-quarter -quarter playbook. We're bringing you in on all the market action. With step-by-step -step analysis of our biggest trending tickers. And expert insight into the day's biggest headlines. We'll bring you the closing bell and get you to the finish line. This is Market, market Domination. Domination. Tune in daily from 3 to 4 p.m. Eastern.
Shares of FanDuel parent company Flood are ticking higher this morning after the company saw its U.S. business scaling rapidly with revenue up over 40%. For 2024, Flutter expects U.S. adjusted EBITDA to surge over 200%. That news briefly bringing the stock to record highs this morning. Joining us now to discuss is Peter Jackson, Flutter's CEO. Jackson, thank you for being here, obviously. Uh, I'd imagine you're in a good mood this morning, so it's great to chat with you. I know that you see the company's profit tripling moving forward. What would you say is the biggest catalyst behind that growth? The biggest catalyst for growth for Flutter as a whole is clearly the outstanding performance we're seeing in FanDuel. We're the number one business in online sports betting, and we were delighted in January when we became the number one brand in iGaming as well. You know, we added significant customers onto the platform last year, 3.7 uh, million new customers onto the FanDuel platform. And we'll consider, you know, the business will continue to grow this year, We're acquiring as much business as we can. And that's falling through and helping us boost the profitability of, of FanDuel. And coupled with our global business, our international business, which is growing as well, positions us very well to keep seeing those profits grow. Peter, you mentioned acquiring as much business as you can here in the U.S. How do you do that? Because it is a landscape, it is a industry here that's getting, it seems like, more competitive almost by the week. Yeah, we've always operated in a very competitive environment. If I think about the years in which we've had you know, FanDuel live in the market, there's always been you know, competitors coming hard into, into the market and trying to steal com uh, you know, customers' attention. We think that the best way to, to keep winning in the market is delivering the best product we can. You know, so this March Madness, we've got our live same game parlay products available for customers to bet on on the first time um, in, you know, in, in March Madness. And you know, that's proving to be very popular. You know, we hit record all time highs in the Super Bowl, you know, over $300 million of handle bet um, on the Super Bowl off the back of some of the fantastic uh, products innovations we've had uh, there as well. And so if we can keep delivering great innovative products for our customers, we know we'll keep bringing them onto our platform. Well, regarding that growth in the U.S., I know that the company is hoping to make the primary stock market listing uh, here in the United States, and shareholders are voting on that move in May. What do you anticipate happening with that vote? We've seen very strong support from shareholders for, for this um, secondary listing we picked up on the New York Stock Exchange, and I was absolutely delighted to ring the bell on the 29th of January and usher in this big change for, for our business. So we'll now go to shareholders. We have our AGM on the 1st of May, and we're convinced that they will you know, whole, wholeheartedly you know, back a shift to move our primary listing to the New York Stock Exchange. That will become effective on the 31st of May, and at that point, we'll become a primary listed U.S. business and will become eligible for inclusion in the U.S. indices. And Peter, also another uh, key metric to watch within your industry and obviously with your competitors as well is just the promotional spend. When you're out there trying to acquire, trying to get more business, trying to grow your footprint, a lot of times you're relying on more heavily uh, heavy promotional spending. What does your plan look like for that? And ultimately, how do you walk that balance or how do you balance that, right? in terms of promotional spending, what makes sense, but also keeping in mind the pressure that that is then eventually going to put on your bottom line. One of the advantages we have of being such a global business, we have so much expertise in terms of understanding the lifetime value of customers that we acquire. And we are very conservative when we look at the calculations we make to determine you know, the valuations of the customer and look at the, you know, the marketing money that we spend to, to acquire them. And if I look at the customers we acquired last year, in, in the United States, they were paying back within 20 months. Uh, we made money last year. Uh, and so, look, as you, as you shared at the top of the show, we, we expect our uh, profitability to grow significantly uh, in the U.S. market this year. So, look, we're acquiring as much business as we can. Whilst ever we meet those 20-month or less return criteria, it's great business for us to be doing. And Peter, I'd be remiss to not get your take on some of the sports betting challenges that we're hearing about in the news here. Obviously, the NBA investigating a player for potentially betting on himself and also all of the news surrounding uh, the MLB with Shohei Otani and his translator in alleged sports betting there. What is your take on the news that we're getting about all of these scandals regarding betting? Integrity is absolutely paramount to, to sports, and it's something that we take incredibly seriously. We have a lot of people focused on that and identifying 
any suspicious activities or patterns that we see in our business, and, and we'll share that with the with the appropriate leaks and codes. Now, I think that the extent to which the authorities can make sure that we can block out these black market operators who are not interested in those types of um, sort of activities and you know, uh, frankly, don't really care about customer safety either. Uh, the better. You know, we spent over a hundred billion dollars, hundred million dollars last year on sort of safer gambling. You know, forty-five percent of our customers are using tools to make sure that they're protected on our platform. And it's really important that we, you know, we stop customers accessing these black markets where you know the operators, frankly, are incredibly uh, irresponsible. Peter, how do you screen? Do you screen for professional athlete activity, collegiate athlete activity? Uh, on your platform, and and if you don't, what are the plans? Are there any plans to enforce something like that in the future? Well, clearly, this is something that we need to make sure we get right in terms of providing education to the you know to the to the teams and, and the athletes. And you know, we spend a lot of time uh, helping support those activities, and and also to make sure that we screen to the extent we can on our platforms as well. So you know, both of them are important, but ultimately, the education piece I think is the is the best way of tackling this. So education then, Peter, versus any sort of action items on the platform? Look, we can, we can take actions on our platform, uh, and we do, but ultimately the, the way to, to eliminate this is, is up front and make sure that the athletes understand the situation and know that this is not something they can do. Peter Jackson, Flutter CEO, really appreciate you coming on. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, we're watching shares of Viking Therapeutics this morning surging on positive new results for its experimental weight loss pill. Joining us back at the desk with a lot of news on her beat this morning, our very own Anjali Kimlani. I haven't introduced you without saying that literally I, ever. <laughs> uh, so, hello. It's a busy lady. <laughs> always. Healthcare, healthcare beat, always good. Yeah, so Viking Therapeutics now out with their, their phase one result of their weight loss pill. This is different from what we heard last month, which was, which was the phase two of their injectable. And what phase one does is just test the safety, but they also got a nice little bump in that after the 28 days of testing this pill, patients showed an up to 5.3% weight loss. So that's really positive news for the company. That's why you see the stock jumping right now. And Viking is gearing up to be really good competition for the market leaders now. That's Novo Nordisk and Eli Lilly. In this weight loss space, these GLP-1 drugs really, you know, just looking at the race that's on, Viking looking to be one of the leaders among the biotechs there, at least. Uh, we did see last month the phase two injectable already showed pretty strong results by comparison to Wagovi, which is a Novo Nordisk drug, and Zepbound, Eli Lilly's drug. So as you can see on your screen, you know, Novo facing a little bit of pressure on this news uh, because of Viking now up more than 21%. It was up about 26% just a few minutes ago. So really a strong day for the company on this news. Definitely a strong day for them. Anjali, thank you so much, as always. Really appreciate it. Coming up, a key chip partner to NVIDIA investing billions in a new U.S. facility. What it means for the Biden administration's broader push to bring chips production back to the U.S. We'll tackle that after the break.
NVIDIA partner SK Hynix planning to invest around $4 billion to build a chip packaging facility in West Lafayette, Indiana. This according to a report from the Wall Street Journal. Now, South Korean chipmaker SK Hynix serving as NVIDIA's exclusive partner for its most advanced GPUs. This is according to the report. While the investment, it's a boon to President Biden's goal to bring more extensive chip production here to the U.S. So here to talk a little bit more about what this means for the semiconductor landscape, we want to bring in Matthew Ramsey. He's T.D. Cowan's managing director and senior research analyst. It's great to see you here. So talk to us just more so about, obviously, further investment with making chips stateside here within the U.S. What's the broader impact down the line for the chip industry, for the chip sector? Uh, good morning. Thank you for having me on. Yeah, it's uh, it's a major initiative, um, the, the U.S. government, um, handing out significant CHIPS Act funding. And you mentioned um, SK Hynix in your uh, opening comments there, but um, Intel announced last week mm -hmm. um, $8.5 billion in grants and another $11 billion in potential loans um, to build factories in the United States. Um, it's no secret that Apple, Qualcomm, NVIDIA, um, AMD, lots of the top chip companies um, in the world that are driving the PC market, the smartphone market, the, the data center and the AI market are all manufacturing most of their products in Taiwan. Um, and and there's, there's obvious political uh, tensions around Taiwan with the US and China. So uh, the industry investing over a very long term to diversify geographically to, to Europe and also to, to the United States chip production, not just high end chip production, but as you mentioned, packaging, testing, a whole bunch of layers of the supply chain is super important for the industry and sort of long-term contingency planning and supply chain management for the, for the whole industry. I think it, NVIDIA is super topical today with investors, but it's, it's um, anything that you have in your household or in your life that has electronics in it has chips that come from Taiwan. And I think the industry is, and a lot of governments are spending time and money trying to diversify the supply chain. And I think that will continue going forward. It's gonna take time. Yeah. Uh, we've been to some of the TSMC factories in Taiwan and every building that you can see in every direction is a supplier into the fabs. Um, so it's not just replicating the, the fabrication of chips and the manufacture of chips, but that entire supply chain. And it's going to take time, but it's really encouraging to see the investments by the United States government and the European Union and, and a lot of other political figures that are understanding the importance of the supply chain diversification. Well, given that you've seen that up close for names that are not NVIDIA, the TSMCs of the world that you just mentioned, I'm curious about any of NVIDIA's competitors that could stand to benefit from the Biden administration's push to increase domestic chips production. What are the other names that could really get a needed push that could allow them to compete more directly with NVIDIA from this chips production push from the Biden administration? Well, it's a good question. I think there's there's a couple things to think about there. There's there's one, everybody's kind of in this boat together in terms of uh, concentration of supply in Taiwan and in Asia. Um, but there's a couple of companies that are uh, really pushing. One is Intel. Um, there's some challenges currently with their product roadmap for AI and for servers relative to their competitors, NVIDIA and AMD. Uh, but manufacturing um, stateside is something that Intel's done for decades. They're um, the largest chip manufacturer in, in the United States by, by a wide, wide margin. Um, they have big factories in, in Ireland and in Israel, um, in, in Europe and Asia, respectively. Um, Micron is another company that um, there's three big memory suppliers. You, meant, you guys mentioned one of them, um, Hynix, the other obviously being Samsung. But... The third big memory supplier is Micron, and they're a, a U.S.-based company and could benefit from the CHIPS Act as well. So I think those are the two companies that are probably aligned the best. Um, but Intel is going to get a, a huge amount of this money because they politicked and, and pushed to get the CHIPS Act over the line with the U.S. government, and I think it will benefit them. But I've kind of described it as it, it's certainly a necessary step um for them to regain competitiveness with nvidia and amd but i think it's not the only step there's a lot of things in their product businesses and their software stacks that need to be addressed to to really take advantage of ai but um, intel dominated chip manufacturing globally for three or four decades um, they've had some challenging times over the last five to seven years and they will certainly be a big beneficiary of these dollars that are being handed out at when and if they get their product roadmaps back on track to be competitive at the high end 
Matt, let's talk about NVIDIA. That is what investors have been wanting to talk about, a stock that obviously they've been closely tracking now for quite some time. You joined a number of your colleagues out there recently raising your price target on NVIDIA. Your new price target out now is 1100 bucks. I'm curious, when we talk about that endless momentum that we have seen behind NVIDIA stock, what's the key? What did you walk away from the big event of just last week with that you're so convinced that this movement to the upside is going to continue? Well, we've been, I think NVIDIA has been our, our top pick in our team for, for the last 18 months uh, or more. And the momentum continues, as you say. The, the big thing from the GTC conference last week, well, other than I, I, I'm not sure that I've ever seen a semiconductor executive speak in a keynote in an, an entire full NHL hockey arena with 12,000 people before. So that gives you some level of, of an idea as to the, the interest and the importance of this company and, and its leadership in the AI space right now. Uh, but the, the other big thing from last week was the launch uh, and details around their new Blackwell GPUs, which um, are taking the training of AI models performance up by about four or five times versus their hopper generation. And quite remarkably, the inference performance for that part of the AI workload for certain configurations of their new Blackwell product, it's raising that performance level 30 times versus the product that they're shipping currently on hopper. And so if you look at the software stacks that they're doing, the fact that they're attacking the entire system across CPUs, GPUs, um, their own specialty networking, their own specialty memory, they're building full stack servers. Um, a lot of their competition are doing just inference or just training or just CPUs or just GPUs. Um, NVIDIA is attacking the entire stack. And I think the momentum that we're seeing now transition from not just the, the big internet hyperscale companies now into other vertical industries like climate change, like healthcare, um, and slews of others. I think it gives us very high confidence in the momentum continuing for at least the next four to six quarters. I mean, when we talk to investors, most of the angst that anybody feels around NVIDIA is just the fact that the level of growth and the speed of growth of their data center business is just uncomfortable because it's so unprecedented. It's not because we see um, any kind of slowing of the momentum at all. And I think for us, the next um, six to eight quarters, as I mentioned, is, is got some very, very high visibility to, to remarkably strong growth. And then I think we will hit some level of law, law of large numbers at some point, just given the scale that we're talking, but their data center business is gonna do close to $100 billion in revenue this year. Uh, we're modeling another 25% growth for next year. And that probably is conservative based on some of the supply chain numbers we see. And unlike, what happened 20, 25 years ago in the dot-com boom and then bust, a lot of companies that grew at this rate back then were not that profitable. NVIDIA just put up a almost 67% operating margin mm -hmm. quarter. Um, and, and so they're bringing through the profitability on top of the remarkable revenue growth. And I think they're um, set to continue to do that over the next couple of years. Yeah, and it looks like the stock down eight tenths of a percent in the market trade so far today. Matthew, thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate it. All right. Thank you very much. Well, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis has signed legislation restricting social media access for kids. On Monday, DeSantis signed HB3. That prohibits children in Florida under the age of 14 from becoming social media account holders. The, le the legislation, however, does allow 14 and 15 year olds to get an account with parental consent. This comes with heightened scrutiny in Washington over the impact of social media on children. Here with more is Yahoo Finance's Rick Newman. Rick, what do we need to know about what's going on down in Florida? Well, in that visual, we saw some kids standing around DeSantis. Uh, you know, they, they can't be real happy about this. And uh, I think uh, a lot of this is going to get challenged in court. Uh, it, there, there have been other efforts to do this to, uh, in, in some way, restrict access to uh, social media accounts by kids, uh, also to ban TikTok. And the courts keep saying, no, you, you can't really do that. So um, that's probably what's going to happen here. So just to review what this law would do in Florida, if you're under, if you're under, if you're 13 or under, you cannot have access to any social media accounts. And if you're 14 or 15, um, you have to get parental permission. So, I mean, we know all the problems enforcing these kinds of rules. Kids whether they're uh, nine or 10 or 11, I mean, they, they quickly become smart enough. They put in fake ages um, or they find other ways around, which will probably continue. So I think what this law is intended to do is a couple of things. First, put the burden on the companies to make sure that the kids are not getting access. 
But let's uh, keep in mind, uh, Ron DeSantis is no longer a presidential candidate, but he probably will be again. And I guess he uh, thinks that continuing on as a social warrior is his um, pathway to uh, a brighter political future. So um, this is sort of the new version of Ron DeSantis, culture warrior, social warrior, uh, and I guess this is where he thinks his future is. So this is probably going to get overturned, but this is more of DeSantis uh, making his mark uh, than I think any effect it's going to have on social media. Yeah, Rick, that's exactly what I want to talk about. It's almost like why the point of this in terms of, because he did receive backlash when he's done something similar in terms of uh, his attacks on Disney uh, over the last several years. There was a uh, backlash there. But when it comes to going forward, some of the legal challenges that you were talking about, walk us through if we know about any sort of timeline of this and what exactly they could be potentially facing when it comes to some of those First Amendment issues. Uh, well, the uh, the social media industry um, is not, it's not like they're getting caught by surprise by any of this. I mean, they have lawyered up, they have lobbyist up, and uh, they have marshaled a lot of research, resources. They've formed uh, lobbying groups in Washington, D.C. They've um, created alliances so that all of the big firms are represented by trade groups rather than having to go after these one at a time. So, uh, I mean, they're going to throw everything they can at getting this overturned. I mean, there's a similar case. I mean, it's a bit different, but Montana tried to ban the TikTok app in the state, and that is in court. And uh, a judge said, nope, we're not going to, um, that, that can't happen. So it's going to go all the way up through the appeals process in Montana. And I, I mean, I think there, there, there are other statutes states are trying to pass you know, this, this, I mean, it's just, this is just, I mean, the problem is real with, um, you know, kids getting addicted to apps. That definitely is a problem in the, the stuff they see on there and they don't want to read books. They don't want to go outside and play, uh, run around in the woods or play on playgrounds and stuff like that. All legitimate problems. Um, but finding, you know, passing laws to solve the problems is, is just very difficult because, um, you know, these are companies that have the right to promote their products and they're not always the ones who say whether the kids are going to get, uh, you know, get access to these products. So everybody finds a workaround. The kids will find a workaround. And the well-moneyed uh, technology companies are going to probably have a good shot at winning uh, challenges to this law. All right, Rick. Always great to talk to you and have you on here. Thanks so much for joining us this Hi, morning. Guys. All right. Well, keep right here on Yahoo Finance. We've got much more of your market action ahead. Stay tuned. We'll be right back.
WeWork founder Adam Newman not giving up on the company that popularized co-working spaces while riddled with controversy. The founder now offering half a million dollars to buy the company out of bankruptcy. That's according to the Wall Street Journal. That half a billion dollar offer a far cry from the company's top valuation at $47 billion in 2019. So how did we get here? Let's break it down. WeWork was founded back in 2010 by Newman and Miguel McKelvey with the vision to, quote, create environments where people and companies come together and do their best work. The company's first office space was around the corner here in Soho in Manhattan. WeWork's valuation surpassing $1 billion in 2014, that gave them unicorn status. SoftBank valued the company in a funding round at $47 billion in January of 2019. Fast forward to August of 2019, WeWork filed for its IPO. Newman tried and failed to take the company public after its IPO prospectus <laughs> revealed billions of dollars in company losses year over year. That fallout led Newman to step down as CEO about a month later. Then heading into 2020, the pandemic put more pressure on margins as people worked remote rather than from co-working spaces. WeWork started trading on the New York Stock Exchange following a SPAC merger in October of 2021. On the first day of trading, the company was valued at just over $9 billion. But as losses continued for the company, WeWork became a penny stock, landing the company in bankruptcy status, officially filing for Chapter 11 bankruptcy on November 6, 2023. The stock traded at around 84 cents the day the company filed and has fallen even further. Checking out the stock right now, looking at about 32 cents there. All right, well, the latest on a developing story that we are following here at Yahoo Finance. The Francis Scott Key Bridge in Baltimore collapsed after it was struck by a cargo ship earlier today, causing vehicles to plunge into the water. Rescue operations remain underway, with crews still searching for six people who are suspected to have fallen into the water. Two people were rescued, with one transported to a trauma center in a very serious condition. This is according to authorities. Maryland Governor Wes Moore declared a state of emergency earlier today. U.S. Coast Guard officials saying that footage posted online indicates that the vessel had some mechanical issues just before hitting the bridge. The preliminary investigation of the collapsed bridge points to an accident. This is according to Governor Moore, who told that to reporters this morning. The collapse of the bridge could disrupt shipping at a port that consistently ranks among the top 10 busiest ports in the U.S. Ford CFO telling Bloomberg TV that the bridge collapse will affect its supply chain and is looking to reroute car parts to other East Coast ports. Shares of coal companies that ship through the port of Baltimore are also falling this morning. Consul Energy is down just up nearly 8 percent and Arch Coal is also off nearly 5 percent. We will keep an eye on this story and bring you the updates as we get them. Coming up next, our new show, Wealth, dedicated to all of your personal finance needs. Brad Smith has you for the next hour. That does it for many and myself today. We'll see you tomorrow morning.
wealth. Earning it, growing it, and managing it. It's more than tracking just the latest market moves. It's more than your favorite trending tickers. One does not simply build wealth without considering the entire financial landscape. It takes a community, and we've built one for you. On today's show, a big week of data matters for your money, so does financial confidence. We look at the best ways to use it, and credit scores aren't just a thing of the past. We look at your perfect credit mix. Plus, thinking of an early retirement? I am. Here's how to keep the money flowing. Welcome to Wealth, everyone. I'm Brad Smith, and this is Yahoo Finance's newest guide to building your financial footprint. Our community of experts will give you the resources, the tools, the tips, and all the tricks that you need to know to grow your money. Your wealth theme for today, smart spending habits. From managing your credit to figuring out the best way to make money after retirement, plus on a fun note, we'll also look at what to do if you suddenly come into some cash that you weren't expecting. We begin with some fresh data today. It's been a busy week filled with a wide range of economic indicators, and it's all punctuated on Friday by personal consumption expenditures, or known in your hood as PCE. This is the Fed's preferred inflation gauge. Out this morning, we also got another read on the consumer, consumer confidence, and this is why it matters for you. You may be asking yourself, am I putting enough into my savings account, or will the economy improve more soon? Well. The Consumer Confidence Index is a widely followed economic indicator that measures the level of optimism or pessimism U.S. consumers have over the state of the economy. The survey is administered by the Conference Board and is based on a monthly survey of 3,000 households across the United States. These questions cover consumers' financial situations like their income expectations, purchasing behavior, and even job prospects. Responses are then weighted and combined to create a composite index number. The index is benchmarked at 100, so that reading above 100, it signals that consumers are more optimistic, while a reading below 100 suggests increased pessimism. Now, the consumer confidence for the month of March, that came in at 104.7. That fell short of Wall Street consensus expectations, but signals that the consumer remains strong despite sticky inflation. And confidence certainly matters, especially in your path to even smarter spending decisions. With the right attitude, anyone is wired for wealth. At least that's what our next guest says. So let's bring in Echo Huang, who is the Echo Wealth Management Financial Advisor. Echo, great to have you here with us on this show. Let's begin this conversation and discussion just around how consumers can start to really implement better spending strategies that are best for their financial circumstance or situation. Hi, Brad. Uh, I'm glad to be here. For consumers, uh, based on the recent uh, data, uh, actually their uh, expectation index has declined just a little bit, but a lot better than a year ago. So uh, consumers right now are feeling a little bit I think pessimistic in the short term, but I think in the long term, if they manage their behavioral finance uh, better, they can start. Uh, what I would suggest is definitely start with their own circumstance because the indicator alone is not enough. They need to look at more than just uh, a little bit of the indicator. They need to manage their uh, emotion, especially the emotion, no biases and cognitive biases. So for example, um, overconfident uh, investors may trade excessively, and that is not a good thing, actually. So they need to find out how to manage that emotion and avoid trading excessively and destroy their own return. Another uh, bias I want to mention is uh, investors, sometimes they have the regret averse uh, bias. They may have problem selling a stock that has climbed recently. Uh, you know, they try to not to sell the really hot investment uh, to avoid the regret. I think the best way to uh, start building wealth is manage uh, behavioral biases and then also 
Secondly, make sure you create your own personal financial plan based on your own personal goals, time horizon, and the market condition. Because it's really important, I think, for everyone to obviously have emergency fund mm -hmm. and have a budget. Very importantly is the having a budget that they can work and review and adjust. Right. I would suggest everyone have a five-year cash flow plan because it's much easier for them to be able to see where the money is coming from right. and how they are spending and saving and invest with long-term perspective. And Echo, you know, just further coming back to the data because we were really focused in on, you know, what this data signals, not just about the consumer right now, but to your point, how we can adequately plan going forward from here. And it was interesting, within the conference board data, they mentioned that consumers remained concerned with elevated price levels, which predominated some of the write-in responses. So in terms of making sure that there are little decisions that add up to big results that consumers can make on a daily basis, where do you typically advise some of your clients begin? I would definitely advise clients that uh, they need to look at this as a, uh, these are the short-term data, obviously, and, you know, the conference board release it every single month. And right now is not as bad as a year ago. Of course, for the short-term, investors should be still looking into the, um, obviously, the stock market valuation. And I believe right now the S&P index is the valuation is relatively full, may not be extreme, but it's above 20. So in my mind, for clients, I would advise them for the money that they need to withdraw for mm -hmm. the next five years, they really shouldn't have the money in the stock market, especially when the valuation is relatively high. That's a great so point. I, yeah, I would like a client to make sure that they have a strategy that focuses on diversifying across asset classes mm -hmm. and geography and sectors right. so that they they are not surprised by the risk they are taking. And they I don't want them to act based on the daily news about recession. There Certainly. is still a potential for recession, but I do not want people to go and read it and say, well, the index is below this number, may signal a recession when it's below this number, right? Right. But we still need to build up the confidence by creating the plan, and you don't need to work, uh, do it by yourself. I think investors should definitely counsel trusted financial advisors to develop their plan right. and help them adjust the investment plan based on their own situation and also market conditions. And just very lastly, we only have about 30 seconds left here, but as you were mentioning here, it, it is the perceived likelihood of a U.S. recession that's perhaps some of that long-term or uh, you know, one of the larger implications that could hit on confidence. How can people maintain confidence in their own spending habits and their own budgeting despite that perceived likelihood? Yes, uh, definitely celebrate uh, small wins. Uh, review their own situation, uh, set aside a goal saving monthly. If they're able to monitor that and cut out uh, some discretionary spending and focus on long-term saving and also short-term emergency fund, over time with the plan, they are more likely to succeed. And I, I believe that uh, by planning right now, to gain confidence uh, to own their future. And uh, certainly uh, people can check out my book, Own Your Future, on Amazon on different steps to build financial confidence and clarity. Echo, thank you so much for taking the time here today. Echo Huang, who is the Echo Wealth Management Financial Advisor. Good to see you. You're welcome. Have a good day. Well, let's switch gears here for a hot second. April 15th is approaching rapidly. And remember, that's tax deadline day. How could we forget? We know that paying taxes is unavoidable, but it seems like people will do anything to reduce their tax bills. Last year, many Americans were on the move, opting to relocate to states with lower tax rates over those with higher ones. Many Americans moved to no-income tax states in 2023 to get some extra bang for their buck. States like Texas and Florida gained hundreds of thousands of residents over last year, 
So is it worth it to move for the tax saving? And how much can you really save by moving? Yahoo Finance's 2024 Tax Week crunches the number so you don't have to. So is it worth it for you to move to a different state in order to save on taxes? Huge question. Yahoo Finance reporter Rebecca Chen has the big answers for us. Hey, Rebecca. Hey, Brad. So one thing that you really want to consider when moving, if you're thinking about moving to a different state or picking a state to move to, you definitely want to think about the tax implication because after all, it is some of the highest expenses that we all incur during our daily life. And I do want to touch on two kinds of taxes that everybody should really look into before making that move. And the first is property tax, and then the second, as we all know, is state income taxes. So let's dive into property tax a little bit. Um, across the nation, we all have different property taxes in different states, different regions, even cities. Um, and all of these places, you can, as you can see on the chart here, they are charge you different prices for your home. As we can, and if you really look into the numbers, we can see that New Jersey and Illinois has some of the highest effective property tax rate in the nation, while Alabama and Hawaii has some of the lowest property tax, uh, effective property tax in the nation. But aside from just looking at the rates, you really want to look at their medium home prices and apply that to the rate to see how much you are expected to pay on your property taxes each year before you make the move. So definitely look into the rates of the area or state that you're interested in, because that is going to impact how much you pay every year on your home. And the second thing that we really want to look into when you're thinking about moving state, of course, is the state income tax. This is probably the biggest reason why Florida and Texas has been gaining so many new residents, because um, in states like Florida and Texas, there's actually zero income state. state zero state income taxes. That means when you move there, all you have to pay for is the federal taxes and you're good. But on the other hand, if you're looking at moving to a places like California or New York, you're really paying some of the highest rate in the nation. For example, uh, the highest rate in California is about 13.3%, and for New York, it's about 10.9%. Now, just want to clarify, not, you're not paying that percentage on all of your income, but these are marginal. So the more you make, the more you will have to pay. So definitely, when you are thinking about whether you want to move to a different state or which state to move into, look at these two uh, big topic and big items that could cost you money, a lot of money, and see what really fits inside your budget and your preference. Yeah, that's a great starter rubric, Rebecca. Given that people are willing to move state to state to save on taxes, there has been some discussions of the fairness of the tax system. President Biden continues to say that billionaires aren't paying their fair share. So how is he proposing going about this? During his um, last State of Union address, he did mention something about the billionaire tax. So this is, this is not something new. He has been sending the same message throughout his term. And what it basically is that he wants to impose a 25% minimum tax on uh, people who have $100 million or more in value or more in assets. Um, so we don't really have that much information on exactly what this means right now, whether we are taxing unrealized gains or whether we're taxing income. It is something that is a continuing development. But I think what is very interesting is that we have been looking on some data and polls, and it shows that almost 70% of Americans, they in swing states, um, they do support some kind of legislation where you, uh, our government would tax the rich a little bit more. But whether how much that is, how we're going to tax that, or who is considered the rich, we don't quite know that yet. But this is a popular, it's a very popular hot topic in Washington right now. Yeah, really important for voters across party lines, it seems increasingly, based on that poll that you just cited. Rebecca, thanks so much. Appreciate it. Coming up, everyone. Where's your credit score at? 700, 800? I mean, there's a big difference between the two. We're gonna break down what it means and how to keep it healthy. We've got all that and more on Wealth after the break.
Let's talk credit. We all need some, but how much is enough? A new report from Open Lending and TransUnion found that 30% of millennials and Gen Zers are more likely to improve their credit scores within two years compared to just 22% of older generation. Now, that's good news. Building credit is necessary for taking out loans, making big purchases, or receiving more favorable interest and insurance rates as well. There are a few factors that affect your credit, and one important one is your credit mix and diversifying your financial profile. What's that, you ask? Well, let's bring in Yahoo Finance's Kendall Little to break it down for us. Hey, Kendall. Hey, Brad, thanks. So uh, when we're talking about credit mix, we're really talking about the mix of different accounts that appear on your credit report. So this can mean installment loans, such as a mortgage, a student loan, an auto loan, but it can also mean revolving credit. So your credit cards, if you have a home equity line of credit. And this mix is really part of the formula that makes up your overall credit score. It accounts for about 10% of your score under FICO scoring system, which means it's not the most influential factor. It's still really important to pay your bills on time every month, making sure that you're keeping that positive payment history, and to make sure that you're not overextending yourself on the amount that you borrow and what you owe. But credit mix is still a really important part of that overall picture that makes up your credit score. And it can really help you maintain a good score over the long term. And that's because this credit mix uh, helps you show lenders that you can responsibly manage your different loans and different types of credit. You can borrow money for different purposes and pay it back. And so when you go to apply for those new loans and those new lines of credit, then you look less risky to those potential future lenders. Kendall, thank you so much for setting this conversation up uh, and some very valuable information there as well. As we continue this discussion here, home prices are on the rise. According to the latest reading of the Case Shiller Index, the seasonally adjusted national average seeing a 6% rise year over year and a 0.4% rise in the past month. Now, this comes as the housing market struggles with an inventory shortage and high mortgage rates. And while both are making it difficult for Americans to buy homes, your credit score is also a very significant factor. It predetermines what banks and lending institutions commonly refer to as worthiness. So let's bring in Yahoo Finance's Molly Moorhead to tell us more. Molly, first and foremost, we gotta begin there. How are consumer credit scores tied to mortgage rates? So your credit score is one of the key things a mortgage lender is gonna look at when you apply for a loan. And it tells them how good of a risk you are for lending money to. And your credit score is essentially a snapshot of how you've managed that in the past. And that can tell them how you're gonna do managing it in the future. And it includes things like your record of on-time payments, your length of your credit history, meaning are you did you just take out your first credit card last year or have you bought cars before and paid off loans and shown that you can manage that debt. And um, generally, the higher your credit score yeah. goes all the way up to 850, the better the rate you're going to qualify for. So it, it makes a very big difference when you apply for a mortgage. So what can people do to improve their credit score and, and make sure that they're getting more favorable rates when they go to apply for a mortgage or if they're just trying to make sure that they can make a car payment even in the future? There's a lot you can do, yeah. but I'll say this, it's not easy and it doesn't happen fast. Mm -hmm. But the two, the two biggest things you can do are pay your bills on time. Late payments really ding your credit score. And then the second thing is just to pay down debt. I know that's easier said than done, but if you have a number of credit cards with a low balance, pick one, focus on it, throw all the money you can at it until it's paid off and then move on to the next one. Um, and so paying off debt really makes a big difference and you'll see it over time in your, reflected in your credit score. Credit score aside, other factors that go into mortgage rates more broadly? Lots of stuff. Uh, your debt to income ratio is another big one and that's essentially your total debt divided by your income. And it shows lenders how much money you have left over that you can put toward a mortgage payment. Mm -hmm. It's expressed as a percentage and you wanna keep it in the low 30s if you can. And then they look at other things like how much money you're trying to borrow. Uh, median home prices, as we know, are higher, you know, 400, 450,000. Um, how much money can you put down? That also is a good sign to a lender. And then things like the terms of the loan. Is it a 30 year? Is it a 15 year? Um, so those are outside of your control. But your credit history, your credit score, your managing your own debt, much more in your control for getting a better rate. All right.
Very important uh, to keep on the mind, especially when you're out there perhaps doing some of the, the seasonal home buying and engaging within the spring buying season. Molly, thanks so much for taking the time. Thank you. Absolutely. Coming up, everyone, planning that early retirement you always dreamed of? Hey, maybe. Well, you don't need money to maintain your lifestyle. We'll give you the tips of the trade from the voice on the issue. Do not miss that. Plus, much more wealth after the break. Having enough money to retire is a big issue for a lot of Americans. BlackRock CEO Larry Fink has entered the debate warning of a looming retirement crisis. That's if boomers don't help younger generations save enough for their futures. Fink issuing the call in his annual chair letter, saying America needs an organized high-level effort to ensure that future generations can live out their final years with dignity. So why is preparing for retirement important? Well, 2024 is a big year for retirement in the U.S. More than 11,000 people are turning 65 every day this year. That's according to a report from the Alliance for Lifetime Income. But you might be able to retire early without hitting that milestone. To break down what you need to know, Robert Powell, Retirement Daily Editor, is here with us. Robert, great to speak with you. Great to see you here. First and foremost, you hear the call from Larry Fink and what he's trying to do to ensure that future generations have the same type of access to retirement. What needs to happen right now? Well, I think a couple things. One is we have to look at the demographics. Folks who are in the highest income quintiles don't have a crisis. Folks in the lowest income quintiles don't have a crisis. It's really the people in the middle who have to struggle for saving for college and saving for retirement at the same time. For them to make ends meet, 
they need to make a, a, a dedicated effort to save as much as possible for their retirement to ensure that they have the desired standard of living once they retire. And I think that's critical. You can always take out loans to pay for your child's college education. You can't take out a loan to pay for your retirement. And so with that in mind, how do people decide whether or not early retirement is right for them? What are you typically hearing as people are making those decisions? So Brad, I, I, take, I look at it in a couple, three ways. First and foremost, look at longevity. If you retire at age 60, you might have to fund 40 years of retirement. If you retire at age 50, you might have to fund 50 years of retirement. If you retire at age 40, that's 60 years of retirement that you have to fund. So first and foremost, have you crunched the numbers to really understand whether your assets will last 60 years of retirement or will you, will you have to decrease your standard of living in retirement? So also, if you retire before age 65, you'll likely have to buy health insurance if you're pre-Medicare. So that's an additional cost. So if you haven't crunched the numbers, what I suggest is get help, get a second opinion, and consider using a financial advisor if you go down this path who can use a series of retirement readiness tests. Um, many advisors just use something called the Monte Carlo test, which is a statistical analysis that will tell you you have a 70%, 80%, 90% chance of meeting your retirement goals, but it also conversely means that you have a 10 or 20 or 30 percent chance of not meeting your retirement goals. So in addition to Monte Carlo, I would suggest that people ask their advisor to give them what's called a fundedness calculation, which is very similar to what pension plans use to determine if they're overfunded or not. And then the last thing would be to add another test called back testing, where you're looking at would my portfolio have, would I have been able to withdraw, say, 4 percent per year over the past 30 years? in these market conditions. So use a series of three tests. Um, by the way, most financial advisors and most off-the-shelf uh, retirement software calculators just use Monte Carlo. So don't settle for Monte Carlo because it's not going to give you necessarily an accurate picture. I would prefer that people get triangulate around these three measures. And if all of them are green lights, then I'd say you can afford your early retirement. Right. Um, and then the other thing is, not only should you do these three retirement tests, but you should stress test them and make sure that you're looking at best case, probable case, and worst case outcomes. Because the last thing you want to do is retire and then think, oh, I've made a mistake. And then, Brad, the last thing I'll mention before we move on is in retirement, you're going to face at least 15, maybe even more retirement risks. There's the risk of outliving your assets, with, which we've discussed. There's the risk of inflation. There's stock market volatility, or what sometimes people refer to as sequence of return risk. There's interest rate risk. There's public policy risk. Perhaps taxes go up. There may be unexpected health care shocks that you'll face. There may be a, a death uh, or a divorce or a remarriage, or there may be changing housing needs. And what you really need to think about if you're going to retire early is have I managed and mitigated all the risks that I might face in retirement? And to understand that there will be different tools to manage those different risks. So for instance, with longevity, the, the notion that you might outlive your assets, an annuity is perhaps the best tool mm. to manage that risk. But with inflation, uh, stocks may be the best tool to manage the risk of dealing with inflation. Sure. So don't just think that one tool can satisfy or mitigate or manage all these retirement risks you might face. Certainly. And, and Rob, you laid a lot of really good points right there. You know, one one of the things that I think many of us think about and, and in the risks of early retirement, because early retirement sounds great, sounds rosy, you come up with a, a patent, file for it perhaps, maybe be able to sell it to some large mega cap tech company or something, and then just kind of float off into the distance somewhere. But there are risks to early retirement. You began to lay some of those out as well. Is the number changing? And, and we usually have this kind of generalized number, this average number that many people should save up for retirement. How significantly has that number changed in recent years? Well, it's, it's changed quite a bit as people rely less and less on a defined benefit pension plan and as perhaps Social Security represents a smaller and smaller portion of one's retirement income, the need to set aside enough money to fund your desired lifestyle over 30, 40, 50, 60 years becomes greater. Now, some companies have used rule of thumbs, which I'm fond of. If you want, you can start here. Companies like Fidelity, T. Rowe Price and others have said, at retirement, you should have anywhere from 10 to 12 times your final year's salary set aside in your nest egg, and that should be enough to, for you to comfortably live on. Uh, another measure I like to use is something called the 4% rule, but I like to flip it on its head and to say, how many years of, of, of retirement will your fund cover if you were to withdraw 4% per year from your retirement? If it's greater than 30 years or 40 years, 
that's great. Otherwise, you may have to sort of um, decrease the percent that you withdraw from your fund, and that means decreasing your, sta your desired standard of living, which to me is a retirement failure. If you can't fund your desired standard of living, that's a failure to my, to my, to my way of thinking. The, the other thing, Brad, that I'll mention is we've talked about the money side. There's the emotional side to retiring early. Uh, many people retire from something, but not always to something. Hmm. So I think before people decide to retire early, they should take the time to think about what am I retiring to? What will my purpose be in retirement? Will I garden? Will I travel? Will I volunteer for nonprofits? Uh, what will I do? And, and among those things, as you think about what you're going to do in retirement, make sure you have enough social interaction. There have been many studies that suggest the fewer social interactions you have, the, the shorter your lifespan will be. So make sure as you retire early that you have plenty of social interaction. Well, Rob, guess what? Uh, I think I have the answer for what I would do if I was to retire early coming up in the next segment. We're going to let you go, but you can stick around, hang on the Zoom line if you just want to listen in to what I'm going to do if I'm able to uh, stack up enough coins to retire early. But for right now, we'll leave it there. Robert Powell, who is the uh, uh, editor over at Retirement Daily, thanks so much for taking the time. Thank you, Brett. I appreciate it. Well, the Mega Millions jackpot drawing is tonight, and the prize, the big one, is over $1 billion dollars. What would you do with that cash? As the popular social media phrasal template goes, if I ever win the lottery, I won't tell anyone, but there will be signs. That's right, don't be surprised by my newly constructed manatee sanctuary or my sudden stake in the Philadelphia Eagles. All kidding aside, there is a responsible way to manage coming into a large amount of money, and importantly, make it last for the rest of your life and make sure the right people get it after you've won. Now, to break this down for us, we have Emily Irwin, who is the Wells Fargo Wealth and Investment Management Managing Director. Emily, I'm not sure what you would do with that kind of money, but hey, uh, we, can, we could toss around some ideas. But what, what can people do to ensure that they are stretching those dollars if they do come into unexpected cash? Well, you're starting with the right mindset, which is not make any big public decisions, <laughs> but certainly put together a team so you can start building a foundation of what your future looks like. And this is a real opportunity for individuals to be able to put together a team of interdisciplinary professionals, attorney, CPA, insurance specialists, potentially even social media specialists, philanthropic specialists, and asset protection specialists to be able to put together a plan for them. They really wanna think about short-term and long-term goals, and you really want to focus on not just the dollars and cents at this point, but what are your goals and values? And to the last segment, how is this going to not just affect your pocketbook? How is it going to affect your family, your emotions, and your social interactions? Certainly. And so let's, let's kind of break this out into two areas here, the short term and the long term. Short term, a lot of people are immediately like, OK, well, I got to pay off some debt here and there. But long term as well, what is the thinking that they should be positioning as we're kind of thinking about what that immediate or more imminent decision making financially is versus some of the extended time horizon? Yeah, so short term, you obviously first want to consider how are you going to take the winnings? And so you want to think about the lump sum versus the annuity payment. Lump sum, of course, you're going to get your winnings. You're going to pay a fairly large tax, assuming you have that $1.1 billion ticket. And then you're going to have some with um, some additional tax bills come next year because they're only going to withhold 24%. Plus, you're probably going to have some state taxes depending on where you live. So that's number one. An annuity is a really good idea. If you're someone who has a dollar in your pocket, you're going to spend a dollar fifty. The annuity might be a good plan for you because it's going to be consistency over a number of years. By contrast, the lump sum's advantage is you get to have freedom with respect to investments, spending, saving, and giving. The other thing you really want to think about is debt. To your point, it's something that you can clean up on your balance sheet in a very confidential way. However, rates in the most recent years have been low. So if you have, for example, a mortgage rate that's at 2% or really anything under 4 you might consider just letting it lay for a little bit. But you do want to aggressively attack anything like revolving debt, higher interest rate loans, student loans, um, anything of that nature that's above that 4% threshold. Let's really start throwing dollars to that. And just Thinking, last, yes. Yep, go ahead. You know, I just wanted to add on this additional thought here, too. As we think about the protection of that money, is it possible to insure and, and, and protect some of those winnings? 
Absolutely. So this is the more long-term plan. Longer term, you're thinking about things like gifting, estate tax, asset protection. Mm. So you want to make sure you're meeting with your advisors. This year, you're lucky. The estate tax exemption is $13.61 million. That is fantastic news for anyone who's going to be able to start doing some lifetime planning, because that means you can set up various types of trusts potentially that you or your loved ones may still have access to, maybe not full control over, but you still may be able to access and benefit yourselves, your family, or community while moving those assets off your balance sheet. You also might consider things like life insurance, not for income replacement, but maybe you're going to diversify into illiquid assets. And you want to make sure you have liquidity on your balance sheet to pay anything like an estate tax. You put those in a trust as well, because while they pass income tax free to beneficiaries, they don't pass estate tax free. So you really want to look at long term, how can you move the growth off of your balance sheet? And because it's an election year and we know January 1, 2026, the estate tax laws from a federal perspective are set to sunset and go back to $5 million index for inflation, now would be the time to start that planning. Emily, thank you so much. I already know what I'm doing. Uh, first and foremost, I'm going to legally change my government name to first name Bless, last name highly favored. Emily Irwin, who is the Wells Fargo Wealth and Investment Management Managing Director. Thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you. Well, coming up on Wealth, is a recession really off the table? We'll tell you what to think about it if it does materialize. But first, we get our daily dose of Maconomics with Ross Mack, Maconomics founder and personal finance expert. Here's a little taste of what's to come. Now look, first things first, a tax refund isn't just a magical bonus that the government was feeling generous about giving you. It was actually your money in the first place. You were just paying the government too much in taxes the prior year. Yeah, guys, you were giving the government an interest-free loan. So before you try to take that money and actually make a real big purchase, you should ask yourself, would you have made that purchase the year prior? Exactly. So let's actually talk about what you should do with it. So you want to talk about cryptocurrencies and specifically Bitcoin. Well, when the price falls, people will try to convince you it was never a real asset. When it jumps, the crypto bros get excited and tell you that it's bigger than gold. A lot of the time, it's all anyone can talk about. 
Bitcoin has rocketed higher this year, up over 60% in just a few short months. Now, we're back above that $70,000 threshold. So, you may be feeling that FOMO if you don't have any Bitcoin in your portfolio. Here to tell you why it may not be too late to ride the Bitcoin train, we've got Maconomics founder and personal finance expert, Ross Mack. Ross, should crypto be in the portfolio and why? Brad, thanks so much for having me. And look, here's the thing, right? The short answer is absolutely, right? You just really got to ask yourself, what is Bitcoin and why should it potentially be in your portfolio? And I think that it's going to offer a more diversified approach to just the traditional asset classes, that being stocks and bonds and real estate, and as you mentioned, gold, right? And I think when it's all said and done, you just got to ask yourself, where's the smart money? And now with the emergence of institutional investors buying Bitcoin, it's going to be way more... It's going to be a lot less volatile moving forward, right? We, we're talking about BlackRock. We're talking about Fidelity. And sometimes you got to ask yourself, right, this is the greatest technological advance in our lifetime, right? We've seen the internet in our lifetime. Now we're talking cryptocurrency and obviously artificial intelligence moving forward. And when it comes to Bitcoin, I think hindsight is always twenty twenty, right? The average person is going to say, man, why didn't I buy it 10 years ago? But the reality is moving forward, with the emergence of Bitcoin ETFs, with the fact that this is a finite amount, right? Only 21 million Bitcoin will ever be mined. And the reality is if every person in the world or every person in the US for that matter, wanted to own Bitcoin, well, guess what? They can't. And so because of that, because of that demand and that limited supply, the price should only continue to rise higher. Well, so there's the volatility aspect of this too. And I mean, it's HODL, HODL, hold on for dear life for a reason because of that volatility at times. So what tips, can you give someone who may be nervous because of that volatility going in on crypto? I love that question. If you look over the past 10 years, right, when it comes to volatility, the price of Bitcoin has declined over 50% of the time, eight times. And guess what? We're in that eighth cycle, meaning that in all of those times, the price of Bitcoin has decreased over 50 percent of the time. And guess what? It has gone on to recover and also make new highs. And because of that, right, you got to ask yourself, OK, if I'm buying this, what is my investment horizon as well as what is my risk tolerance? But understand this. Bitcoin is a long term hold. It is a great asset to hold for the long term. Therefore, right, getting into it, you have to be able to stomach some losses. I wouldn't recommend buying crypto if you are afraid of having any drawdowns, but I truly feel as though moving forward with the emergence of actual new institutional investors buying it, I think that we will see a lot less volatility moving forward. It should be a lot more stable. But to the average investor, the way I would approach it is don't actually look and try to time it, right? I want you to approach it the same way I would tell any person when it comes to investing in traditional stocks. You want to dollar cost average, right? One month from now, it might be higher. One month from now, it might be lower. But the reality is you're looking five, 10 years down the line. And 10 years down the line, right, we're talking 2034, where 99% of all the Bitcoin would have been mined. Well, guess what, right? We're talking once again, the, the supply is limited and the demand is only going to continue to increase. And I think that if you approach a dollar cost averaging, meaning you're buying the same amount every month or every week, or every quarter, right? But irrespective of the, if the price is higher or lower, it will take all of the guessing work out and you will find yourself a lot happier in the years to come. All right, Ross Mack with the case for crypto and Bitcoin. Ross, thanks so much for taking the time today. Thanks for having me. Good to see you. Well, the Consumer Board, or well, the Conference Board rather, the Consumer Confidence Index shows that Americans aren't as worried about a recession. Likewise, economists and the Federal Reserve are forecasting continued economic growth in 2024. So is a recession completely off the table? Joining me now here live in Living Color on set, we've got Jennifer Streaks, who is the Business Insider, Senior Personal Finance Reporter and Spokesperson. Tell us about the signs a recession could still be on the table. What signs are you tracking here, Jennifer? Well, we're looking at high inflation. Inflation is really lingering and it's proving to be hard to, to kill. And so I think that consumers are really dealing with high prices at the grocery store, the gas pump, and just in everyday life, these high interest rates, which are trickling down to credit cards, which are trickling into everyday life is just making it harder for the consumer to spend and to take care of their everyday lives. So I think that there are also to be determined factors that haven't been decided yet. We're looking at an election. We still don't know what the economy is going to be doing in six months. It's still too early to tell. 
And so with that in mind, I mean, the perceived likelihood of a U.S. recession over the next 12 months, as measured by the conference board, they, they mentioned that consumers remain concerned with those elevated price levels that you mentioned, predominated in right in response, but an uptick in concerns about food and gas prices, which you were mentioning as well. So all of these things considered, you know, what is the general expectation as to where consumers can perhaps offset some of those fears of a recession as well? The first thing you've got to look at is your spending. Mm. discretionary spending and where you are putting your money. Do you have enough of an emergency fund in place? Are you carrying a high credit card balance from month to month? Are you subjecting yourself to that high interest rate? How is it that you're spending every day? Look at how you're spending your money. And so with those spendings, what are the simple decisions that people can make on a daily basis to make sure that those discretionary spends are smarter than the day before? You definitely have to look at what you're spending on groceries. Mm. You have to look for sales. You have to take advantage of stocking up. But the bigger items, where is where's the high interest rate impacting you? If you are carrying a high credit card balance, you've got to get out of debt. You've got to reduce your debt, pay down your credit, get your credit utilization down. That way, the high interest rates are not a concern to you. Go through your budget and look at it, am I spending a lot in terms of subscriptions, meal planning, that gym membership that I don't need, but also in terms of big purchases. Do you need a house right now? Do you need to look at a home right now? Or a car, or even home renovations in terms of expensive refrigerators or microwaves. Anything that is going to make you a target of the high interest rate environment, you need to take a second look and decide if whether right now is the time to do that. That's great tips. Jennifer Streaks, Business Insider, Senior Personal Finance Reporter and Spokesperson, thanks so much for joining me on set. Thank you. Absolutely. Well, coming up on wealth, stocks are high, volatility is low, but nothing lasts forever. We look at some alternative places to part cash. There's much more on wealth after the break. You're watching Yahoo Finance. Stock market volatility may be at a multi-year low, but that means being on high alert isn't a bad thing. As investors brace for potential market swings ahead, there may be a space worth looking at. Alternative investments, such as real estate, hedge funds, or private capital, that could be a good place to put some money. For more on this, I'm joined by Michelle Martin, who is the Prosperity President here. Great to have you here with us in studio. First and foremost, 
we think about different assets to put cash into, but cash is already the most liquid asset that you can have. So where else is there liquidity in some of the asset classes out there? Yes, yeah, so Brad, as we think about, about alternative investments, mm -hmm. that used to be reserved for just the, the wealthy. Yeah. Um, and now there's liquid alternatives out there. You can actually invest in an ETF that has downside protection as well as mutual funds that have downside protection. The beauty of that is they are liquid. They have next day liquidity, which is very different from a traditional alternative investment like real estate or a hedge fund or maybe even private equity. How does alternative investments, uh, how do they de-risk a portfolio perhaps? Essentially, what they can do, if you're, if you're looking to de-risk your stock portfolio, it can buffer on the downside. So it's a, it's a strategy that's, that's covered with puts and calls. And so um, it, typically there's a buffer. It can be 5%, 10%, even up to 25%. So if the market's volatile and it goes down, you're protected at that, at that loss buffer. And the, the thing that's really interesting about it is you can participate still in market returns. Mm -hmm. There's some caps there. You, may not, you won't be participating in the full upside, but if risk on the downside is important, and for most people it is, it can improve returns over time. And so alternative investments can be anything from investing in art to buying out a, a piece of a music catalog. I mean, there's so many things. It's a, it's a wide range. What is the number one thought that someone should immediately have that should come to the top of their mind when they're even thinking about putting part of their portfolio into an alternative investment as well? Alternative investments really, as you said, it can be very illiquid. Mm -hmm. Typically, the more illiquid, the more risk, but the greater potential for return, right? So it's like the building blocks of your budget. It's the building blocks of your portfolio. Do you have enough liquidity? Do you have the portfolio structured in a way that's going to meet your needs if you need to tap into it? And then it's really about knowing what's in your portfolio and why you have it. And if you are investing in um, real estate that is going to have a five to seven year life or a piece of art, it's just understanding how that fits into your overall objectives and what your return expectations are as well. What is the alternative investment in 2024 that is just ripping to the upside right now where you're seeing a massive amount potential of, uh, of inflows into it? Alternative credit is a space that has been really wonderful for our client portfolios. Um, aside from traditional credits uh, or tr traditional credit, just you know, typically we're in a place right now where interest rates are are higher. Mm -hmm. So investors, that that can be really good news for our investors. So a typical return on a core bond portfolio today is around five percent, but in the alternative credit space, we're seeing returns anywhere even from eight to ten percent over the last year. And so that's that's really been an area that we've seen some true outperformance in our portfolios. Really fascinating. Uh, tracking that. Thank you so much for joining us here in studio. Michelle Martin, Prosperity President here with us on Yahoo Finance. Well, we're wrapping today's show, but tune in at 11 a.m. Eastern Time tomorrow. Guess what? We're going to talk about potentially dangerous tax advice on TikTok, targeting millennials and Gen Z, and we'll dig into what you need to know for your taxes if you invested in crypto last year. Plus, want to pay less for your car insurance? Who doesn't? We all do unless you're taking the MTA out there. Well, we're gonna tell you all you need to know about usage-based coverage. Yeah, write that down, we'll come back to it tomorrow. All that and more when Wealth returns at 11 a.m. Eastern time. That's it for now, I'm Brad Smith. Thanks for watching.